Greetings from Walgot Forums. This is Hasina Parvin, CEO and editor in chief of Walgot Forums. Welcome to the day two of virtual WGF GBIF. To open the day two of virtual WGF GBIF, I would like to introduce Dr. Farooq Vasil as our opening speaker. Dr. Farooq Vasil is a practicing educator, a published author, and a columnist. Epitomizing lifelong learning, he has authored several textbooks on early years and primary education, academic book on pedagogy from perception to perspective, and very recently, a book on school design. He holds a doctorate in education and is also the recipient of the President's Best Teacher Award in India, 2007 and the GEMS Fellowship Award to pursue leadership management at Cambridge University. He has also been felicitated for his contributions towards education with the Lifetime Achievement Award by ZTV. And one of the 100 World's Greatest Leadership 2015, Asia and GCC for his contribution to the education sector. In May 2016, he was honored for outstanding service in school education at the UAE Leadership Education Conference and has been recently awarded the Star Leadership Global CEO Award. Dr. Vasil's long and illustrious career span more than four decades, and he has carved a significant niche in the educational landscape of GCC, India, and Africa. He served as Secretary of the CBSE Gulf Council for 2000, from 2001 to 2002, and then chairman of the CBSE Gulf Council from 2002 to 2003. His repertoire of leadership competencies encompasses a range of portfolios that include executive principal of our own English high school, Sharjah, UAE, deputy head of GEMS, Asian Curriculum Schools, Director of Asian Schools, GEMS Education, Senior President, Everon India, and Chief Academic Officer, GEMS India. Before superannuating, he was the Global Head of Affordable Schools, GEMS, Advisor to GEMS Education, and many leading chains in India and abroad. Currently, he is the CAO of Vassal Education Group and Director of Thingsight. Now I invite Dr. Farooq Vasil to deliver his opening speech of day two, please. The topic of his opening speech is Global Perspectives on the Future of Education, How to Maximize Opportunities, Minimize Challenges, and Optimize Learning. Thank you very much for the opportunity given to you know, share some of my thoughts. Uh, and concerned as an educator, uh, having worked in the industry for the last 45 years. And the existential question that keeps um, uh, coming to my mind is, how is uh, education relevant to current times? And how is this education preparing children for the future, which is so uncertain? You know, radical uncertainties. As they say, that future is no more the function of past. You know, and it has no precedent. Uh, look at the world today. You know, if you look at uh, some of the uh, icons, uh, Facebook, uh, Mission of Mars, Hussein Bolt, Gmail, all these things have happened in a very small time zone, which has disrupted the environment because the kind of churning that's in the environment outside, the rate of uh, change that's happening outside the environment. And if our rate of learning does not match and exceed, then uh, we have an existential threat. So what's important is any organization, corporate, schools, or the institutions, and society as a whole. The rate of learning has to be higher than the rate of change in the external environment. And if we don't strike this balance, then we are for a root shock, you know, and uh, the, the fight will intensify and uh, the machine will take over because today, if you see the fight between the man and the machine is intensifying and machine is trying to control 
and we have to be you know we have to accelerate our own thinking and learning if you look at in 2004 uh, none of these unicorns existed airnb you know chat uh, twitter you know whatsapp all these things did not exist so what it has done to us we need to ask ourselves this question uh, what Einstein said that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking that created them. And uh, by and large, if you look at the educational industry, I keep asking that in which way, if you look at the world over the last 150 years, that it has not changed. You cannot imagine in every way it has changed, but the schools remain the same. You know, for the last 150 years, look at the school. By and large, you get the same feel, the industrial model, didactic teaching, you know, with the okay occasional um, changes happening here and there. By and large, uh, it does not really give you a glowing picture. It's grim in, in most of the world. The future has no precedent when I say, because if you look at the 85% of Fortune 500 companies that existed before I was born no longer exist. And in the next decade, about 40% of the S&P 500 will disappear from the list. 65% of the 12-year-olds today will work in jobs that do not yet exist. And uh, my grandchildren, you know, may work in industries that do not yet exist. This is a reality. So future of ed education, then what are the trends that are impacting the future of education? What are the key drivers of these changes? Uh, changing forces, if you see today, the power shifts eastwards. There's a global connectivity. We are talking about sustainability. We have green technology where genetics, robotics, internet, nano is, you know, revolutionizing our life and living. We have economy, we have politics and regulation. We have also anxiety on that account. We have gaps between population and economic growth. We have correlation between youth and innovation. We have increase in longevity, we have decline in fertility, fertility, we have changing cultural norms, we have new family forms, we have changing demographies. These are very hard realities, uh, the changing forces we need to recognize. We have, you know, we, are, we have paradigm shifts taking place from adaptation, not extinction, tightening regulation and rising prices, rise of the confused green consumer, local energy networks and micro-generation, boom in clean energy, IT, transport. Look at impact of, suppose, if the oil, uh, you know, the, the cost comes around 175 a barrel, what will happen to the economy is a tailspin. So we don't understand this. Uh, we don't recognize the challenge of interdependence, how it's going to impact our lives and impact uh, countries as a whole. Genetic prophecy and personalized medicine, robotics, more intuitive and sensory internet versions. When I say machine and man is fighting, it's becoming intense. Machine is becoming more intuitive. It's becoming self-predictive. It's developing some kind of emotion around. So the human beings must understand they are getting more and more vulnerable. Though I still believe that human intelligence is supreme because ultimately they have created this you know, machine. So they will uh, overcome it. But we need to be very careful because we need to strike a balance. You have these changing forces on new nanomaterials. You have growth in artificial intelligence. You have virtual offices and institutions, which is going to revolutionize the way we think institutions should be built. So future is already here, but that's, it's unevenly distributed. We predict the future, but leader can and should help to invent. I mean, post-corona, we must draw a great learning that what happened to us, we are not alone. We are not any more private person. A small development in any part of the globe is going to have huge impact on the populations around the globe. So uh, therefore, uh, that inclusiveness, need, we need to create a collaborative environment to address some of these life-threatening issues, some of these existential uh, threats which are now being perceived and are visible within the environment. If you see education, you know, uh, look at the institutions, uh, the amount of money we invest in infrastructure, not recognizing that the uh, the most of this education space is now uh, inhabited by the virtual uh, platforms. So we need to rethink on school designs, institution designs, connecting education institutions with the world beyond, 
uh, as a means of promoting holistic learning. A whole to part orientation instead of part to whole orientation. And em emphasis on the importance of meaning rather than drills and other forms of uh, rote learning. Learning as a lifelong process rather than something done to prepare for an exam. So lifelong learning will be the greatest growth industry. Learning cannot be, you know, I think what uh, Arthur C. Clarke writes in, you know, we have to abandon this idea that learning is something connected with the youth. How it can be when the, you know, uh, uh, children when they are 20, all that uh, they have learned will not be relevant when they will be 40 and all that they learned at the 40 was never invented when they were 20. So that kind of churning in the, you know, environment, disrupted environments we have. Focused on the social nature of learning rather than on students as separate, decontextualized individuals. Focus greater attention on diversity among learners' study of individual differences. You know, I, I keep saying that there are four myths about learning. One myth is that uh, uh, school is the best place to learn, uh, which is not the case because 80% of learning is outside the school. So why is that ecosystem? How do we account for that? Another myth is that intelligence is fixed. When I was a student, we were told that either on the extreme of the bell curve or in the middle view, you know, exist. But we have now, you know, our learning has evolved over a period of time. We talk about multiple intelligence. We talk of multiple learners. We talk learning styles. And so our understanding of learning over the last 200 years has evolved. So therefore, you know, it will have an impact the way we work. And, and the third myth is, you know, uh, teaching produces learning, which is not the case. I always say, if you haven't taught, they haven't learned. So we need to, you know, ask serious questions on on the teachers' competencies, capacities, and skill sets. In and uh, the fourth myth is that uh, we all learn the same way. That's not the case. Every child is different, unique. So therefore, education in institutions and as adults, in so that kind of learning environment or ecosystem, we need to create. We need to recognize these, you know, uh, realities about learning. Uh, also, the shifts taking place, you know, learner autonomy, learner today uh, asks for a choice. Uh, I mean, are we in a position to exercise the choice? You know, how far we're geared, how our institutions are developed, how a course curriculum skill sets are developed to exercise this choice. We are talking about today, you know, uh, different pedagogies, we're talking about cooperative learning. Uh, collaborative learning we're talking about curriculum integration so that they're not seen as separate you know um, entities we're talking about teachers as co-learners where they have to question their own learning they have to reflect we're talking about alternative assessments we're talking about mobile as a critical platform we're talking about rising transparency between individuals in institutions earlier on in institutions where secular center were you know uh, doing whatever they were doing they were not within the visible um, uh, public eye today, they, they need to have high level of transparency because uh, they're vulnerable and uh, they have to be transparent at every level. Growth of distance learning, location free jobs. Look at Corona, what has happened. Even those who never had this, uh, you know, skill sets to do online learning, even they came forward and uh, they became over a period of time masters and they have learned great lessons that how the environment will be disrupted and how we need to prepare ourselves so we cannot wait for these disruptions i keep saying that if you disrupt the environment you're safe either you disrupt or be disrupted it's a choice which we need to exercise so cyber security too much of information real time data prediction markets and open innovations these are some of the forces which will compel us and which will force us to rethink ourselves, rethink education, reimagine our leadership and skill sets. You know, if you look at this braving uh, new unpredictable world, uh, we have technology and innovation on one side. We have social and demography on the other side. We have a world of work which is totally disrupted. We have education which is wired now. If you look at defining trends, uh, the change uh, uh, when it was linear, there was some comfort. Now it's exponential. Uh, some of the realities are, if you look at a printing press and telescope, it took 200 years to get the telescope after we invented the printing press. It took 150 years from telescope to steam engine. 
it took 50 years to telegraph it. But look at, suppose, from 2000 onwards, if you look at the kind of innovation, the kind of change and the churning that's happening. You're talking about microprocessor, word processor, MS-DOS. You're talking about 3D, 4D technology or Google, you know, endless YouTube, hybrid cars, DVDs. What's happening around? And these disruptions are coming back to back. So how is how is we, uh, that we are prepared and geared for this kind of radical uncertainty and a change that is churning at every you know short interval? I mean, I always give an example. When I was a young uh, boy in the school, if you go for a camp, uh, you know the provisions we'll have to make uh, uh, to be comfortable. We'll take books with us. We'll take uh, campus with us. We'll take a radio or a record player with us. We'll take camera with us. We'll take torch with us. We'll take phone with us. We'll take some books. We'll take some cash. We'll take map. Today, you know, one this small device, uh, mobile, it has dematerialized this everything. You know how you know it has you know, compressed this whole journey around. Then there's the social and demographic impact. If you look at uh, you know sub-Sahara. You know, there's an unprecedented capability in ordinary people's hands. This is Masai Mara. They, you know, through technology, they today can track their herd across, you know, uh, the miles and miles and miles. So that's what is happening around. If you look at family evolving units, you also have a very, you know, I keep asking sometimes that when we talk about value and ethics, uh, you know, how they will be defined when you have a different family composition emerging. You have single same sex uh, family. We have single parent family. You have these uh, what you call cocktail families that are emerging. So they are redefining your value patterns. And then you have urbanization and smart cities and because the way environment is playing havoc, the way uh, you know, you're not alone. You're not a private person anymore. What's happening around the world is impacting everyone. So uh, it, it's like this. I always think of a man who is sitting on the roadside and claiming that I'm not doing anything. Least realizing that one day this road will be extended, he will have to go. Whether we like or not, whether we like or lump, we will be impacted the way things are happening in this world, even by claiming that we are not doing anything. Then you have this rising inequality, the kind of, it's a very horrifying, sometimes very frightening thought. Today you can see the maybe some eight families owning the poorest 50% of the world's wealth. So these inequalities also are going to impact lives. But uh, the good news is that we live in the most abundant time ever. You know, but we really, this is the only human race uh, which has affluence and there's abundance and which has the power to influence. But the only issue is in uh, the power in ordinary hands. There's also some lurking dangers. In, if you look at the kind of leadership that's emerging, the kind of um, world that is shaping, the kind of political thought that is happening around the globe. Uh, you know, sometimes I ask myself that for 25 uh, years, almost three decades, we uh, educated ourselves that world is a globalized uh, place. And then suddenly when Corona came, uh, we realized there's a lot of protectionism. We are not any more global though there was a you know some response globally but however that uh, globalization in its true spirit would not manifest itself so changing world of work you know the world of work is also changing i mean uh, i'm sure corona has taught us some great lessons so this is uh, work is disrupted this disruption everywhere there's a disruption in product and services labor markets are disrupted, skills are disrupted, business models are disrupted, industry, industries are disrupted. You know, work is, I always say, attention, white collar workers, the robots are coming for your jobs. Uh, if you see the skill disruption, uh, you go by the World Economic Forum, uh, 35 to 40 percent of core skills will change between 2015 and 2025. And uh, that's a hard reality. We need to accept it. Labor markets, uh, good news, I keep saying that for every 100 jobs disrupted uh, in the Asian, you know, 150 new jobs will be created, but Asians will be clear uh, winners. Uh, US will break even. EU, Africa and Latin America, they will be big losers, but there won't be much of a job creation around. Uh, 
creating new businesses and disrupting conventional business models. And again, this man and machine, uh, is, it's intensifying. Uh, technology will not change the way we work, but it will change uh, who we are. And in education, I say technology will not replace teachers, but it will replace those teachers who don't use technology. From simple tools in our hands to being inseparably merged with tools, augmenting our ability. You say this artificial intelligence, how it has revolutionized. In fact, the other day I was asking someone that the moment uh, if you take chat GPT as an academic application, what will happen to the basic uh, fundamental responsibilities of developing these early years and, and the human mind? So these are the questions which educators must ponder and think. So the changing education landscape, it is definitely changing. If you like, uh, look at top 20, uh, say 10 skills in 2015, and if you look at top 10 skills in 2020, 25, uh, we may have to really, you know, relook, rethink our curriculum. We'll have to redesign ourselves because there will be many such core competences, skill sets, which we'll have to develop. So again, uh, 21st century skills we're talking about you know critical thinking we're talking about collaboration we're talking about communication we're talking about creativity and schools need to integrate and uh, embed into the entire curriculum ethos must reflect these core skills across the subjects and they must be in a position to develop them fully so that when they are uh, children grow and open in a world of uh, limit less opportunities but a world of uncertainty that they can, you know, face and apply themselves. It's also about self-management, uh, self-awareness. It's about social awareness. It's about social and emotional learning. It's about relationship skills. It's responsible decision making. Because if we don't invest and work around these children as they grow, we are going to, uh, you know, there's a lurking danger that uh, this may not be a happy place to live in if we don't act collectively and be responsible for what's happening and take uh, responsibility for all the wrong things. So uh, traditional educational models are being disrupted. If you look at the universities, uh, Udicity, you have Udemy, they have better traction, they have better skill certification, they have better you know, uh, sustainability than look at some of the top you know, institutions. The critical considerations for the future are that uh, we need to recognize preparing learners for a world where there is knowledge ubiquity, there is enabling technology, there is disruptive change, and there is unpredictable futures. Character building is timeless. Some aspects of education are timeless. So we must recognize whatever we do, no matter how competent, skilled people we develop, we need not to ignore that some of the timeless characteristics which are important for humans race to survive need to be taken care of, which is decency, kind, being kind, generous and caring, making a difference in the world, good judgment, curiosity, open-minded, thoughtful and adaptable, grounded good values and sound judgment and the enduring competencies in an unpredictably changing world education that inculcates wisdom skills lifelong learning meta skilling learning orientation startup mindset higher purpose and stewardship you know lifelong learning again you have to design around it you have to create a culture and a climate for lifelong learning. You have to remove the barriers. You have to look at the piece of legislation across the country that is it coming in the way of lifelong learning. You know, we have to think from, you know, uh, we have to ask our children, our students and ourselves, uh, what's from what is your major to what's your mission? Because that's a higher purpose of living and learning. We have to, you know, move from animal survival instinct 
to angels of our nature, you know, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs to Baldoni's hierarchy of purpose. When I say, you know, what is, when I said from what's your mission, from what's your major. And then we have to create an abundance mindset. I always say when you cut an apple, uh, you present it and uh, we must see more apples than we must see more seeds. A scarcity mindset is when you see all these seeds. An abundance mindset is when you see more apples. We must remember that it's important to develop a critical reflection that enables us to see the world from multiple points of views and imagine alternative outcomes. We must have an empirical reasoning, cultivate the willingness to abandon supernatural explanations for naturally occurring events. We can overcome our ignorance, not by wishful thinking, but with testable hypotheses using observable data. Data is the king. We need to be well informed. You know, if there is an environmental hazard, we, you know, our perception and belief will be that it is divine. Just it doesn't work that way. We need to look within ourselves. We need to reflect that what is contributing to disaster, how we are becoming vulnerable, is it our doing? And most of the time, if we become, you know, if our reasoning becomes empirical, we will definitely realize that it's our doing and we can, you know, uh, overcome this. We need to create a collective intelligence, recognizing that none of us are an island by ourselves. It is the collective wisdom and collective human intelligence that will help us to move forward. We need to develop metacognition. We need to, you know, our education system that does not focus on memorization, but promoting this metacognition skills to monitor our own learning and also reflect when it's not going well, we alter our approaches for learning. We need to build the institutions which have intellectual capital, you know, level of knowledge and skill that are necessary to take them to the next level. We need to develop the social capital, recognizing that institutions of the future will only thrive on the relationships they build across the globe. In isolation, they will not work. So therefore, social capital must improve. We must work with formal and informal, you know, uh, institutions to strengthen the social capital. We must develop spiritual capital because we are living in this very highly charged, radically churning environment where our uh, spiritual capital must increase because, you know, that will safeguard us from the human greed. That will safeguard us, uh, you know, whatever the evil instincts uh, as a, you know, that we carry with us all the time. And then we must also have the equity in terms of financial capital to build a crossing. I think for me, what's important is that education is uh, everybody's right. And every child must get an equity when it comes to education. You know, I always say every child must get a million plus minutes of quality instruction if they have to succeed in life. The education, unfortunately, the tyranny of normal, the bright and brilliant uh, make it and the less ones are left behind. With the evolution of human mind and our understanding of learning, we believe every child has an opportunity and has a capacity to learn, but he must be giving, he must be given an environment where he can work at a pace and no child should be left by, behind because every human being counts at the end of the day. But unfortunately, um, for education to change, I think uh, it, it should be like a worldwide uh, initiative. It should be an emergency. It should be an international emergency, I will call it. And uh, the uh, affluent uh, societies and, uh, must really come forward to support because we have a lot of people who are out of the school today. We have schools which are not performing. We have schools where we have students coming out without any skill sets, with no promise for future. So therefore, if they are left behind, we they cannot comfort ourselves. You know, I always say, if I uh, don't ensure security of my neighbor, my own security will always be threatened. So therefore, it's important for educators to recognize it is our conscious and collective responsibility that we must break these silos and start building what I call, you know, collective intelligence. 
collective wisdom to address some of the key issues and reach out and then without any bias and prejudice become generous in our sharing of resources sharing of knowledge and expertise i think these are some of the thoughts uh, i am sure that there are many other things which must be you know coming into your mind uh, obviously the limitation of time uh, my only prayer and hope is that uh, we seek divine blessing and strength that we can collectively at least come to a point where the first thing is to build a dialogue and also identify the problem because if you rightly identify the problem that's a 50% solution sometimes we have a blind chase and we cannot go like that we must have to target it issues where we have target solutions in thank you uh, for listening to me i hope you know i have done some just uh, in in conveying my own apprehension and thoughts about the future of education landscape and the challenges and the opportunities we have thank you thank you very much dr vasil for your impactful opening speech now i would like to introduce the next keynote speaker of our virtual wgf gvif ms didra mor jonvie from the united states she is highly successful as an attorney and an author today however at one time even studying in a law school and then writing books were distant dreams before she made her dreams to become an attorney come true she worked for 9 years at tiaa in new york while taking every possible care of her daughter as a single mother after 9 years of hard work she quit her full time job to attend law school full time after graduating from the law school didra began her life career as a public defender in the area of criminal law serving indigent population those who could not afford legal representation for some reason or the other after serving for about 5 years as a public defender didra left her job again this time to enter private practice first as a sole proprietor then in 2006 she launched her own law firm didra armour pc through her law firm she focuses primarily on matrimonial law handling people's divorces trust and estate matters handling people's wills and trust and helping them figure out what they would like to do with their items and assets as the time as the time of their death and mental hygiene law helping people secure guardianship for vulnerable population who can't manage their personal needs and financial affairs today after 20 years of practicing law she feels blessed and grateful for all the opportunities to serve people in all possible ways now i invite ms dibra mor jongwe to deliver her keynote speech please the topic of her keynote speech is in order to know where you are going you must know where you come from what and how should we teach our kids so they are able to build a sustainable world and future thank you hasina parvin to you and your team at the world growth forum for inviting me to this platform never in a million years would i have thought that i would be here on a global stage speaking on a topic that is near and dear to my heart a topic which is in alignment with the values instilled in me by my late maternal grandmother so with that said ladies and gentlemen esteemed guests and an honor to address you today on the topic surrounding a famous quote in order to know where you are going you must know where you come from i'll speak to its meaning in terms of personal growth and self reflection but also in terms of cultural heritage and collective history and i will touch upon a subtopic if i can speaking to how knowing who you are and where you come from impacts the ability of our kids to build a sustainable world and future as human beings we are constantly seeking direction and purpose in our lives right 
we set goals, we make plans, and we strive to achieve our ambitions, right? But how can we truly understand where we are headed if we don't have a clear understanding of where we've been? So let's explore the importance of knowing our roots and how it, how it can shape our path forward, right? I first heard this quote, in order to know where you are going, you must know where you come from, while being raised in my late grandmother's household, being raised by her. She was born on James Island, South Carolina, in the heart of the Jim Crow era. It would be at the age of 28 that her husband, my grandfather, died, leaving behind a 28-year-old wife and their seven children. Within a couple of years of my grandfather's death, my grandmother, in an effort to escape the Jim Crow laws of the South and to make a better life for her and her seven children, she migrated from the heart of the Southern part of America to the Northern part of America, where she settled in New York, where that's where I ultimately was born and raised, right? While living with my grandmother, it seems that everything, every life lesson that she verbalized would either start or end with these two quotes or these two comments I'll say, I'll say, stay in school and go to college. That was her answer for everything. For example, if someone said, life is short, Miss Holmes, she would say, yes, but stay in school and go to college, right? My grandmother's response was always that. She espoused to all of her children and her grandchildren the notion that in order to become whatever you want to become, you must stay in school and go to college. So naturally, Hasina, when I heard <laughs> my grandmother recite this now famous quote, my interpretation was that it meant stay in school and go to college, right? Well, that was just one interpretation of that famous quote. Admittedly, it would be later in life as a young adult that I would come to better understand the message my grandmother intended when reciting that famous quote. Okay? The famous quote holds true in so many aspects of life. It suggests that in order to move forward in life, we must first understand where we've come from, right? This quote holds significant meaning, not just in terms of personal growth and self-reflection, but also in terms of cultural heritage and collective history. So let's take personal growth and self-reflection for a minute. In a, person, in a personal context, let's say, the famous quote highlights the importance of self-awareness and self-reflection. By understanding our past experiences, we can better navigate our future and make more informed decisions. Whether it be through family history, childhood memories, or past relationships, knowing where we come from can help us identify patterns and make changes for the better. As part of my mission, I encourage young adults to learn the value of investing in themselves and in learning about their history. I emphasize to anyone who would listen that no matter what you become in life, make sure that you have a true sense of who you are and what your life is worth. Without knowing who you are, you are bound to make decisions in your relationships and career that could hinder, detract, and or delay you from living your best life, the best life possible. And I share with people that when I was between the ages of 18 to 28, my sense of identity and self-worth, which is essentially what this quote was about, my sense of identity and self-worth was not as strong as it is today. I made many mistakes. I even spent considerable time contributing to, this, to the suppression of my own voice. But while giving myself grace, and while re recollecting a quote by the late Maya Angelou, a quote that read, uh, you do the best you can until you know better, but when you know better, do better. I've come to learn that when undergoing self-reflection and or self-discovery, what ultimately results is having found something precious, your voice. Okay? 
So in full disclosure, I share, I share this quote myself that I created freely with people. As a child, I had no voice. As a young adult, I grew into my voice. And for the past 20 years, I've learned to listen to my voice and to trust it. However, it is important to note that while I have been blessed to do the hard work and find my voice, there are many people who struggle with finding their voice and struggle with the concept of identity development just the same. And we'll talk more about identity development shortly. And this holds true for many of our black and brown children in America and those outside of America who are a part of the African diaspora. Many black and brown children face unique challenges when it comes to finding their voice. Challenges such as racism and discrimination, where you have black and brown children face discrimination and racism from a young age, which can impact their self-esteem and make it difficult for them to form a positive self-image. Challenges such as lack of representation, where you have black and brown children who don't see themselves represented in media, textbooks, or other cultural artifacts, which can make it difficult for them to feel a sense of belonging and to develop a, a positive self-image. Challenges such as cultural assimilation, where black and brown children feel pressure to assimilate to dominant cultural norms, which can cause them to suppress aspects of their identity and make it difficult for them to fully understand who they are. And also challenges such as intergenerational trauma, the effects of past trauma like institutional slavery, colonization, and genocide can be passed down through generations, right? Impacting the emotional and psychological well-being of children from marginalized communities. As a result of these and other factors, many black and brown people struggle with not only finding their voice, but also with identity development. Some struggle with self-doubt and insecurity. Some feel as though their voices are too small and insignificant to make a difference. And many are oftentimes told that their opinions don't matter. And they should be grateful for the opportunities they've been given. This is some of the things that people, that black and brown people are told often, right? Moreover, I know what it's like living in a low income marginalized community, right? In my imperfect nation of America. I know about the households in America wherein families of color struggle to put food on the table every night, to put clothing on the backs of their children, to put a decent pair of shoes on the feet of their children, or to simply keep a roof over their heads. In many of the low income households within America, doing those things are monumental moments, periods of survival. I say this because during my childhood, we were surrounded by people who were trying to survive, but due to the root causes of racism, they were drowning in what I call the symptoms of all the gaps and disparities. They were drowning in the symptoms of all the gaps and disparities created and embedded into almost every facet of what it takes to survive here in our imperfect nation. Albeit the wealth gap, the income gap, the healthcare gap, the housing gap, and most certainly the education gap and all the resulting disparities. This, this environment is where I was raised, you know, and this has been a norm for my family for as long as I can remember, okay? Not many understand how drowning in the symptoms of the root causes of racism manifests itself within poor communities and creates family dynamics that make it difficult for children to succeed and thrive, especially during their more impressionable years. It's critical that we provide these young people with the tools, resources, and support they need to overcome these barriers and make their voices heard. We must do what we can to empower and support young people, particularly those from marginalized communities, Encourage them to speak up, to express themselves, 
and to take action towards positive change. Additionally, by empowering black and brown children to find their voice, we can help them achieve their full potential and create a more just and equitable society for all. But let me, let me point out, personal development, self-discovery, and self-reflection is not just about helping others to find their voice. It's, it's also just as much about identity development. And one's identity, to me, is intimately intertwined with one's history. And that brings me to the other part of that famous quote, in order to know where you are going, you must know where you come from, okay? And that other part of the quote, you know, on a larger scale, it speaks to the significance of cultural heritage and collective history. Again, because a big part of knowing where you come from has to do with what? Knowing your history. No matter where you are situated in the world, the stories of your ancestors and the events that have shaped our society have a direct impact on who we are today. But for me, as an African-American mother, wife, advocate for social change, I strongly believe that we as parents, leaders, advocates for change, have an obligation to carry forward the stories of our ancestors, speaking to the journey, struggles, sacrifices, and lived experiences of our ancestors. We have an obligation to teach our children that as we as a people, we're so much more than what the news media, radio outlets, television stations, books, and other media forms portray us as being. Our children, and especially our young adults, need to know that we are a resilient, courageous, compassionate, optimistic, br brilliant, and beautifully diverse group of people. I also like to remind folks whenever I can that we have not come that far where we can afford to abandon those stories, lessons, dreams, and sacrifices that were made by our ancestors as they endured the most egregious time of our history. Okay? We owe them so much more. Right now, here in our imperfect nation of America, our country is divided over the issue of upgrading the curriculum in schools. A curriculum that would tell the true story of how the enslaved Africans and their descendants have been abused and used to create the canvas for what is known as white privilege. A curriculum that would share the history of how black people have consistently been denied opportunities after being exploited so ruthlessly. Well, notwithstanding the agenda of others, to keep this history out of school curriculum, parents, leaders, neighbors, family, and friends, we have an obligation to tell the stories of the enslaved Africans and their descendants and tell it anyway. There is inspiration and empowerment in the stories that are to be told about the enslaved Africans and their descendants. And these stories should be told regularly and accurately. So our younger generations need to know with full context about the inspirational stories of the men and women who fought for our rights and liberties and sacrificed their lives so that we could be free today. So just let me share a few. They need to know about our ancestors who from 1619 to 1865 endured 246 years of cultural negation as they lived in a society where at every step of the way, it engaged in racial segregation, discriminatory practices, psychological warfare, and consistently tried to dehumanize us to the world. Our ancestors who has, as of 1865, in the face of inalienable rights that were bestowed upon them as freed men and women, who remained subject to repressive and oppressive laws, such as the Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws, laws that continued the practice of exploiting, oppressing, segregating, killing, and devaluing Black lives. Our children need to know about the many prominent historical figures around the world who have fought for justice, equality, and civil rights for people not only in their respective imperfect nations, but for the rights of others around the world. 
People like Mary McLeod Bethune, Marcus Garvey, Fannie Lou Hamer, Nelson Mandela, Ellie Wiesel, just to name a few. So on a broader level, knowledge of history is essential to understanding the world we live in. By studying the past, we can gain insight into the forces and trends that have shaped our societies, politics, and economies. This understanding can help us to make informed decisions about our present and future and to avoid repeating past mistakes. For example, in terms of social justice, we cannot fully understand and address current issues without acknowledging the historical injustices and systematic or systemic inequalities that have led to them, right? In order to create a more just and equitable society, we must confront and learn from our past mistakes. Our past experiences, both positive and negative, have taught us valuable lessons that we can apply to our current and future endeavors. Lessons that can help us navigate our future and make more informed decisions. This brings me to my subtopic, how knowing who you are and where you come from impacts the ability of our kids to build a sustainable world and future. So first, knowing who you are can have a significant impact on sustainability efforts in a number of ways. It can impact your values and beliefs, your lifestyle choices. It can influence, inspire, and motivate you and develop resilience in the face of challenges. So let me touch on each of them just briefly. Your values and beliefs. They play a crucial role in shaping your behavior and decision-making, right? Including your attitude towards the environment and sustainability, right? If you have a strong sense of who you are and what you stand for, you are more likely to prioritize sustainability and take actions that align with your values. Right? Your lifestyle choices. Your lifestyle choices, such as what you eat, how you travel, and what products you buy, have a significant impact on the environment, right? By understanding who you are and what is important to you, you can make conscious choices that reduce your environmental footprint and promote sustainability. Now let's talk a little bit about influences. Knowing who you are and having a clear sense of purpose can make you a more effective advocate for sustainability. By sharing your values and beliefs, with others and leading by example, you can inspire and motivate others to make more sustainable choices. Last, let's talk about resilience. Finally, knowing who you are can help you develop resilience in the face of challenges and setbacks. Sustainability is a complex and multifaceted issue that requires a long-term commitment. It's not gonna happen overnight, at least it didn't for me. By staying true to your values and beliefs, you can stay motivated and committed to sustainability efforts, even when progress is slow or difficult. Overall, knowing who you are can help you become a more effective, committed advocate for sustainability and can help you make more conscious and sustainable choices in your daily life. It's amazing how decades ago, when I did not have a good grasp of my identity and self-worth, I was unaware of the extent sustainability had on our lives. Truly, decades ago, I was merely trying to survive in this crowded and noisy world <laughs> under the manifestation of the gaps and disparities that impacted my life on a daily basis. It would not be until over the past, i say 10 years, that I began focusing on learning about the environment and the impact of our actions on the planet. And ironically, it would be at my son's school, he's 11 years old now, his school here in New York, where they teach the children about sustainability efforts that I came to realize it's never too early to start teaching children about sustainability. I realized that it would be during his early childhood stages that, oh my gosh, you know, this is when children are eager, eager to learn, eager to learn and curious about life, right? And it was about the age of four where here at his school, as a part of his um, school program in kindergarten, they would be taught about the natural world through play and exploration. 
such as going on nature walks, playing with recycled materials, and reading books about the environment. It would be during our son's elementary school years, the ages between six and 10, where he, where he through the programs at his school, started to understand, at least he appeared to start to understand the concept of sustainability and the importance of taking care of the environment. During this phase, he learned about composting. He learned about the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. He learned about energy conservation and sustainable food choices. And last summer, our son, again, through his school program here in New York, he started to understand more complex uh, sustainability issues, such as climate change and environmental policy. And I have to share that it was in, it was in June of 2022, my husband and I, along with our then fifth grader, embarked on a six day global studies trip to the Monte Verde region in Costa Rica with other elementary school parents, guardians, and students. We were able to expand our understanding and environmental, our understanding of environmental stewardship. This shared learning experience was transformative. The venture had tremendous impact on our lives. It taught us about the impact of our actions on the environment and it encouraged us to get involved in community efforts to promote sustainability. I am more conscious about sustainable food choices that I make and its impact on the environment. I've been intentional about using sustainable options such as box waters instead of waters that come in plastic bottles. I'm developing a habit of eating locally grown organic foods. I'm getting involved in more civic engagements by participating in local cleanup events in the community, which serve to promote sustainability. I'm proud to say that watching and listening to our son as he thinks critically about sustainability issues and the impact on our the impact of our actions has been a beautiful thing. He is able to ask questions, evaluate sources of information and make informed decisions. Overall, teaching children about sustainability should be an ongoing process that starts at a young age and continues throughout their education. By instilling these values early on, we can help raise environmentally conscious citizens who are capable of building a more sustainable future. In conclusion, it is clear that knowing where you come from is essential to knowing where you are going. Whether we're talking about personal growth, professional development, or even societal progress, understanding our past is essential to charting a course for the future. So let us all take time to reflect on our past experiences, embrace our cultural heritage, and learn from the lessons of history as we move forward in life. But do me a favor and remember two things. One, stay in school and go to college. And two, in order to know where you are going, you must know where you come from. Thank you so very much. I'm Deirdre Moore Jean Vier, and I'm honored and grateful to have been on this platform. Thank you very much, Ms. Deidre, for such a profound keynote speech. Now let's move on to our panel discussion of today. Technology is an inseparable part of human life. 
keeping water pots and refrigerators at home are one of the simplest examples of technology. Uh, it's just that water pots are a highly simplified form of technology and refrigerators are a complex form of technology. Um, let's move on. On the one hand, we have mobile phones, laptops, CCTV cameras, drones, GPS, social media platforms. And on the other hand, we have latest cars, trains, aeroplanes, and an infinite number of gadgets uh, that help us you know, our in our daily lives. Without uh, most of them, we cannot even visualize our lives. If we uh, remove technology, we would be back to a rural system, which, uh, you know, which by, by the way, was a uh, great system. Perhaps uh, we would have another panel discussion on that some other day. Um, but uh, what, what I want to discuss today is that technology is good. It helps human beings in day-to-day -day tasks traveling and make a, you know making life easier however uh, isn't our dependence on technology making us slaves of technology the topic of our discussion is impact of technology in our daily lives uh, are we creating a better and advanced world of freedom with technology or is the race of better technology shackling our value system uh, eventually creating a world uh, of you know no privacy no freedom and no normal life let's collect some uh, insightful thoughts from our uh, distinguished panelists um, i would introduce them one by one please um, today we have uh, uh, pankaj say with us pankaj is a highly successful and respectful advocate in the supreme court of india with 24 years of standing he is also a winner of the world-renowned Ironman triathlon, which means he is a real Ironman. Actually, he is the only Ironman in the Supreme Court of India. His expertise lies in uh, NCLT cases, arbitration cases, consumer cases, competition law cases, property law cases, criminal law cases, company law cases, cases, uh, family law cases, contract law cases, civil law cases, service law cases. Heat petitions, rent law cases, matrimonial law cases, debt recovery cases, banking laws, insurance laws, um, IT laws, cyber laws, foreign exchange laws, IPR laws, copyright laws, labor laws, sexual harassment laws, and many more. Um, and next, we have uh, Sheena Chohan with us. Sheena is a highly popular film actress from uh, Hollywood, Bollywood, and Indian regional cinema. She has already worked with some of the best actors and directors of the Indian film industry and Hollywood. She's the first Indian actress to win the Hero Award at the United Nations as the ambassador of human rights in South Asia. Sheena is also a recipient of the 2023 World Growth Forum's Best Actor in Comic Role from India, an award for her popular web series, Netflix. Next, we have Mr. Sandeep Arora. Um, he is the executive vice president and business head of digital experiences at Datamatics Global. With over 27 years of global experience in technology, consulting, and consumer behavior, Mr. Sandeep brings a balanced perspective of driving sustainable growth into evolving and uncertain world. He has held various leadership positions to influence industry level change towards digital adoption of business models. His highly infectious energy and enthusiasm are always focused towards driving execution and result. Everything else in, is vanity, as he says jokingly. And now we have um, Mr. Um, Praveen Ankodia with us. He is a superintending engineer in Rajasthan government with over 25 years of extensive and diverse experience in water supply project from formulation, monitoring, and implementation. His expertise covers a wide range of areas, including water supply, lake, uh, lake, lake conservation, as well as uh, sewage and sanitation in the Rajasthan Urban Infrastructure Development Project. He is responsible for implementing Asian Development Bank finance projects. Next, we have Mr. Adam Greenwell. 
with us. Adam is the principal of Adam Greenwell Agency Limited in New Zealand. It is an Auckland-based company connecting international businesses to New Zealand while promoting New Zealand brands worldwide. He is passionate about the future of New Zealand, having both studied in uh, New Zealand Society at uh, Massey University and written a book on the subject. He is working especially in cybersecurity, com commerce, and global humanitarian legacy of his late mother, Professor Elizabeth Greenwell, watering the fields of humanity. Uh, so with all the inst uh, introductions done, uh, let's move on to the questions, please. Um, as uh, Mr. Pankaj has already uh, no, also joined now, so I would like to ask the first question to Pankaj. Hi, Hi. Pankaj. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so my first question is to you, please. Um, yes. In the legal field, right from the subordinate courts to the Supreme Court of India, most of the work depends on technology. First, uh, I would like to understand what role does technology play in the judicial system? And then what are the pros and cons of using technology to handle sensitive information? Is it safe? If uh, hypothetically there's any breach, what would happen? Yes, you know, currently the judicial system is getting access to the online systems and the IT sector. But prior to COVID, it was not so much. But in COVID, we have seen the judicial system. We have introduced something called a hybrid system now. So you can, you can argue your cases. You can represent your cases online. You can hear your cases through VC, video conferencing. You know what happened during COVID? Because there was no physical hearing. Nobody could appear. So in emergent situations, the court started having the video conferencing. And video conferencing has been developed. The government has spent money, the courts have spent money in developing the system. Now with video conferencing around, I can I can argue my case while sitting here in my office. I can argue my case, be it a Supreme Court, be it in High Court, or be it district, district courts. So the technology has actually helped a lot in, in, in developing the judicial system. Now today we realize that it is not necessary to go to a court to argue a matter or to hear your matter. You can sit at home. You can watch your judicial proceedings from home and you can actually see and and gather what is happening in the courts during the cases which are being heard and tried. Now, today, judiciary has advanced forward. We have now e-filing. It is mandatory in the high courts and Supreme Court to e-file your cases. There is e-filing. The orders are, you can get your orders. Now, you don't have to go to the court to get your orders. The courts have developed their own websites. On the website of the court, you can you can download your orders, you can see your orders, you can see each and everything, the time of filing, the date of filing, and what are the objections. It has helped immensely in judicial disposal of cases. It has become much more faster, much more cheaper. There is very less use of paper in while deciding cases. And now the judiciary is more dependent on the technology aspect. Now you put it, you have put it to me that what are the pros and cons? The pros are very good in the sense that now you can sit in your office and you can you can argue your matters, you can hear out your cases, you can download your orders. In fact, not only this, if you want to search for any Supreme Court judgment or High Court judgment, all you have to do is go on a Supreme Court website, type the type the material you're looking at and you'll get all the judgments on that uh, case with on that point which has been decided by the Supreme Court of the High Court. So these are big pros and cons. You can do e-filing while sitting at your home. You can file the case from your home also. It has become now 24 hour filing. Earlier it used to be during the court hours you can file a case. Now you can file your case anytime. Use of less paper is there. It has become more eco-friendly and the hearings are more transparent and more reachable to the ordinary public at large. Yes, definitely there are there are there are limitations also like privacy is there now earlier what used to happen your case was being heard in court and only by the people who are sitting inside the court. Today due to the hybrid system your case can be heard by anybody and everybody who has joined the VC link. Now that that privacy is no more there. But anyway, the judicial proceedings orders can, are reachable. They, they are transparent. They are, unless until it is denied by the judge or it is an in-camera trial, the proceedings have to be proceedings are 
the records of the proceedings are accessible to the people also. But yes, privacy is infringed. There are some sensitive or delicate matters are being argued or being heard. Parties are being exposed to public viewing and to public exposures. Not only that, there are confidential informations, documents which form part of the court record. They are now become, they, they can be hacking and the, the, the record which you have filed in the court, if it is very, very personal and it's private, it comes within the domain of the public and definitely it becomes accessible to the public at large. Great. That Thank clarifies you. a lot of things, yeah, mm, including the legal angle of uh, data safety and uh, data breaches. Thank you. And my next question is for the fellow lady in the pan panel. Uh, Ms. Sheena. Uh, hi, Sheena. Uh, Sheena, you are mute. You know, you're muted, I guess. Can you hear please me unmute. now? Yes, please. Uh, Sheena, you come from the film industry. Uh, you have experience of uh, Bollywood, the regional Indian cinema, and even Hollywood. The way technology is being used in cinema is mind-boggling. Uh, it creates... Uh, you know, extraordinary visuals which are everlasting on the human mind. However, isn't it uh, corrupting the minds of children who must visualize the reality of the world and learn what is rather than what could be? Is technology creating a fake world um, and a fake reality of fantasies for children and grown-ups alike? Uh, wouldn't it affect their thinking and actions in normal lives? Uh, I really feel that, um, you know, um... Has seen that uh, cinema is an art form, and uh, art has and has always uh, had a very tremendous power. Now, uh, how that power is actually used is the responsibility of artists and the society of artists and the culture that makes the artists. So, um, I think that artists making fantasy visuals of Im imaginary places doesn't corrupt children. Uh, imagining what could be is very important in. I think, in fact, uh, visualizing possible futures is the way we work out what potential actions can be taken. Um, as an example, an evidence of this is the world's most uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, bank, Goldman Sachs, you know, has a multi-billion dollar art collection. They have that because they found by putting art on their walls that the banks think more creatively and the bank gets better results. So we can see that art has a tremendous power and that power has to be used for good or bad. Like it can be used either for the good or for the bad. So the medium is not the problem. Unfortunately, the art, especially in cinema, has played a role in the degradation of society in terms of, you know, promoting drugs, promiscuity, violence, immorality. I per se even did a TED talk recently where I spoke about the power of art and I think it is those images of, you know, movie stars doing those kind of things which make the youth, children and people copy that is causing harm to society. So if you want to do anything about it, I think stop watching those kind of series and web series and films that contain so much violence, sex, drugs and bad behavior. Um, if viewers stop watching it, the artists and channel would stop making it. Uh, however, we just have to be more responsible towards consuming and also creating from both the point of view good answer uh, yeah i feel you know cinema is essentially an uh, entertainment platform of uh, storytelling uh, it has the potential of teaching morals to children and grown ups are you know yeah. like uh, in every story um, if only every movie would focus and end with uh, teaching the right values the mode of storytelling wouldn't matter you know, yes. as you said. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. My next question is for Mr. Sandeep. Uh, sir, uh, research indicates that only some of the developed technology or applications get adopted by the users. Based on your experience in driving digital transformations, what are the aspects that act as speed breakers to a logical and successful implementation? Right, absolutely. So I think uh, developing technology is certainly difficult, uh, you know, and applications. But but what is more difficult in my experience is how it basically gets adopted. 
and how people start to use it. Because if you've developed something and it's not getting used, that's not only wastage of uh, you know um, uh, bandwidth at an economic level, but also is time sort of not well spent. Of course, I mean, it gives us learnings, there's no doubt. But uh, in my experience, I've seen uh, places where it sort of tends to work well is uh, are so I mean it basically has some uh, you know uh, combinations around that. So it's very important to begin with. So whenever you are at the stage of designing itself, uh, you know any kind of technology, you have to understand what is the purpose it's supposed to uh, be sort of solving. What is the problem it is addressing, and towards that you really need to understand your consumer and consumer behavior. Uh, there are some technologies which are very quick to adopt, like we would have seen chat GPT of late. You know, within weeks, it was 10 million plus adoption. <clears throat> but then you have so many other technologies which really take a long time before it's adopted. Um, and that is because if you have managed to understand your people well, and if there is something that you are sort of doing which has not been done before um, in, in, in a unique kind of a way, uh, then it basically comes in the way of adoption. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I mean, what is also needed is the fact that when you have developed something, it is also working well. You're not using your people as guinea pigs, you know, uh, waiting them, waiting for them to uh, do the UA testing for you uh, and figure out that, okay, uh, what is working, what is not working. So I think whenever you're sort of deploying technology, you have to ensure that it uh, it is well tested, it is intuitive. It takes uh, logical uh, steps into sort of account. It also has to ensure that uh, <clears throat> that after you have done that, there are things that you do in order to get people on it. In some cases, we um, uh, we drive it through gamification, for example. So if you were to use it, then you get an X points, and then once you start using it, then you get habitual to it, and then then it basically gets into your system, right? So we probably, we have all had, um, you know, so chat GPT is on one side, Facebook is on one side, but let's say if we have applications for our housing societies, right, which require us to approve every time somebody is entering or every time you want to raise an escalation, somebody has to do it. So until and unless it gets into your habit, it becomes difficult for people to sort of start taking on that. So all of those areas uh, sort of uh, work on that. You have to, of course, give some training. You have to ensure that uh, responsiveness and all is there from your support centers. And like uh, Mr. Seth mentioned, I think, uh, you know, under no circumstances, when you launch a particular application, your people should feel that they are being compromised or their privacy is being, uh, you know, uh, challenged if they were to participate in any particular application. So if you sort of uh, have all of these uh, uh, check boxes ticked, uh, then it improves the probability of somebody taking on your technology and your application, and therefore trying to become different. You know, so that that, in my opinion, is sort of a very um, uh, quick way to get to the other side of the horizon. Oh, wow. Uh, most of what you have talked about is technical. However, the way you know you explain things is quite interesting. Thank you, sir. And uh, my next question is for Mr. Praveen. Uh, hi, Praveen. Hi. Uh, you work in a government system, and you are also a part of the professional and technical field of engineering. Uh, among all of us in this panel, uh, you must be the most qualified to speak on technology and um, everything in engineering works on simple and complex technologies in your case you work directly with the improvement and problem solving within the system of water resources uh, in a crucial state of india rajasthan um, obviously uh, when you are directly working to solve water delivery problems of people in a government setup every use of technology must be positive and correct so my question to you is uh, not on overuse of technology or misuse of technology, rather on lack of technology or underuse of right technology and timely use of technology to resolve practical issues and delivery of uh, services to the general public. If I compare India or Rajasthan with uh, other developed countries, 
uh, which have uh, the best water resources management in the world, uh, such as, uh, such as uh, Switzerland, Norway, uh, and New Zealand. The contrast would be more prominent. What can India or Rajasthan do more to create a better and advanced world of freedom with technology? Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Uh, we have been in water business since last 25 years. So we have planned for our water supply scheme. So almost 30 cities in the state. And Rajasthan is one of the very water scarce states. So we need to conserve water. We should use our water judiciously. If you talk about the technology, uh, we have been using the technology, state of art technology. And if you compare with the technology with the other nations, other uh, developed nations, it's uh, as good as uh, what we are using right now. The problem is still, if you compare the service level of developed countries and developing countries like India and other South Asian countries, two things are very important. One thing is portability of water. Another one is the adequacy, whether people are getting the portable water that can be directly used from the tap, and the amount of water, the quantity of water, which uh, we are supplying to the general public, whether it is sufficient. So we lake in both the things. And when you visit abroad in any developed countries, you can directly take water from the tap and drink it because people have a faith in their water supply system. But when you talk about India, across anywhere, from uh, Delhi to any small town, nobody can directly drink tap water. What is the issue with that? We have been using the same kind of technology, same kind of filtration. It's as good as uh, portable water as in uh, New Zealand or any other country. We have uh, same kind of distribution network, but still people don't have a faith in our system. So. What is the problem? Problem is the operation and maintenance of water supply system. And people have almost lost the faith on the public utilities. Uh, and to gain a faith, we need at least a decade so that what, what is happening? We have uh, filtration equipment at every house. And almost we are misusing uh, the water by, while using that filtration technology again. When, government is already providing you the portable water, you again filtering it. It's a wastage of water. So the problem lies with the, with the operation maintenance, the system we design uh, on the specific parameters, the quality of uh, water and the quantity of water and the pressure, what we will say the amount of water we should that should reach to the consumer. Something happens in between the, when you supply the water to the consumer and the, when the consumer receives the water. It's a, what I'll say, it's the lack of commitment from the utility who is maintaining the open, uh, water supply system. And another thing is we have been uh, supplying water on intermittent basis. It's not 24 by 7. And if you go to US or UK, it's on 24 by 7. So anybody can have water at any given point of time. But we have intermittent system and that is the biggest challenge for uh, South Asian countries to go from uh, intermittent water to the 24 by 7. And if you talk about the, both the issues of this uh, portability and the uh, adequacy of water, it's uh, only through the 24 by 7 water we can provide the good quantity of water as well as the quality of water. But few projects we have taken up and uh, we have ultimately commissioned the system on the design parameters what we have already given in our project. But uh, when we talk about the ultimate service delivery to people, people, something has happened. And what I found with our project is a lack of commitment from our service providers. It's so whether you take the uh, government utility or the private contractors. Earlier, it used to happen that the services are with the government. So now we have taken another provision that some private player should be given this duty to provide the uh, drinking water to people. So we have uh, given the 10 years of one time to the uh, contractor so that uh, on the design parameters, which uh, we have already given in the contract cell, that should be continued for another 10 years. But still we feel that uh, there is a lack of commitment from the uh, even private players to get that, uh, that technology fully utilized to give the service delivery. All right. Very nice.
uh, I know you are a great officer and a great professional. Uh, it is really inspiring to know about your work firsthand. Thank you. And uh, uh, Sheena, are you there? Um, Alka, I wanted to come back to you once. Yes, yes, I'm here. Hi, Sheena. Yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted to ask you um, my next question. Without technology and advancements of uh, technology, cinema wouldn't have survived. We have all seen Raj Kapoor's black and white movies, which were masterpieces. We have all seen movies from the Marvel Universe, which are again masterpieces from a simple play of light and darkness through technology. We have come a long way to the mammoth of uh, mammoth play of uh, VFX, where almost anything can be created in the race of better effects, better recreation of reality. Aren't we uh, running away from reality, which is uh, simply a mixture of human values, um, correct depiction of human lives, solutions to various complexities of human lives, and then maybe uh, some fiction, but uh, in the right perspective. The best example of understanding this is when you have you, you leave the movie theater. The first shock is uh, when the doors are open and you step out uh, and then look for your car in the parking lot or, mo or move to the lounge to eat something. So should we use technology to enhance our reality or create another reality which may never be real? That's a very good question, uh, Hasina. You know, I think um, coming back to the artist, I think the artist deals in creating new realities because, yes, through films, through the world of cinema, even if you look at an avatar, for example, which is such a beautiful film, you can see that. It's actually, that's the whole reason for imagination is to visualize, to make something new and create it, you know. And all of the current reality, which was once a dream, I think even the phone that we are holding in our hand or the laptops that we are looking at was first imagined in, like, honestly, in Star, in Star Trek, when you look at that film, you know, uh, and various other science fiction books or films. And, you know, you see that, like, imagination is the first step towards creating the reality. You know, somebody imagined to have electricity and there was light because he imagined that that could be possible. So. Um, I think it may seem that it may not seem like, you know, uh, that that is not reality, but that is only, you know, if you do not use your vision, like it is an imagined potential reality. And I think, in fact, the creation of that reality. So coming to the point is that an artist making an imagined future is just the same as when you plan for your company and imagine that will happen in the next year or five years or maybe in six months, the targets that you set. You know, and you plan it accordingly. It, apart from the artist's vision of a larger film is totally unrestrained and imagines the future for the entire civilization of the world. This is what I feel. So I think this power to imagine the future, which all of us have, all of us have this ability to imagine, to create, is what creates the future. Especially when you have some time off, you quickly think of what you might do with that time, you know, and you imagine a few things. And if you like one of those imaginations more than the others, then you plan it and you make it happen. Like, oh, okay, I want to go for, like, imagine to have, for example, I don't know, a lovely Maharashtran meal. <laughs> but you, you first think about it and you imagine, you know, okay, it'll be nice to go there with the family and enjoy that. I'm just giving you an example. But... Um, Coming to uh, imagination more than others, you plan it and you make it happen. But it was your imagination that first got you choosing that one. So it's the same with designing a house or painting or planning a company or, you know, strategy or anything else. You first imagine it and then you make it happen. So that's what I feel artists do. And they imagine the possible future for us to create. Uh, for, for uh, They imagine the possible future for us. And I think we make them happen. So uh, what is important is that the future that they imagine, I think we need to make sure that uh, that that we do not make films that are so violent or full of like drugs and promiscuity and, you know, lack of morals. Otherwise, that is the future that we are going to create because it is putting that imagination in people's minds also. So what we put out, whether it be through advertisement or technology or our work, I think we hold a huge responsibility. What we watch on TV influences us profoundly and we must choose 
uh, to watch things that do not drag us down and the culture down, but instead lift us up and inspire us. And uh, I think that's uh, that's primarily the reason why I feel that um, you know we a lot of things uh, that are going on in today's world, a lot of that uh, and technology has a huge role to play, especially with social media. And now the whole world is completely changed after COVID. Especially, you can see the influence of technology in social media, and it is a whole new millennial so to say transition so we have to really use the power of technology responsibly great yes you have put things uh, you know in the right perspectives as you know and understand what goes on behind the scenes uh, and and what you you show as an actor on the screen and what you experience as a normal human being separate from a profession yes thank you thank you yeah um, my next question is for adam hi adam Hello, Sina. Uh, you have uh, come from an exciting background of cybersecurity. You have heard all the panelists. You must be thinking, you, you know, um, you, you all may discuss any aspect of technology. It would all come down to cybersecurity. Create any mm -hmm. technology. Create any technology to control any technology. There are always cracks and holes indirectly in any system or network or uh, directly in the technology itself. Cybersecurity has all the answers for human freedom, values, privacy, and normalcy. Uh, but then the entire field of cybersecurity depends on technology and advancement of technology. So aren't we eventually running in circles? Uh, are we all destined to go towards a gradual collapse of everything that we consider human today, and then the entire humanity? Okay, um, that, that's a very <laughs> well-rounded question, and thankfully uh, Sheena has helped me answer it just before I got asked the question. I've been mulling over it. We've all had our questions in advance. Um, so, but the the real issue with uh, cyber security, I'll, I'll give you two analogies in my role within it. My strength is in connecting people. And I find myself dealing with a lot of spheres from cyber security through to hip hop, through to international finance, through to global humanitarian projects. It's just a knack that I've got for drawing people together. And uh, that's analogous just to a fellow who was asked to set up here in New Zealand, the world's first uh, veterinary public health, uh, public health um, unit. And that involves stopping the uh, transmission of diseases from animals to humans. That's a big issue even in the pandemic era, more so in the 1970s when New Zealand uh, it was and is predominantly agricultural. And the interesting thing there, when he was asked for the job, is he said, look, this is not my forte. I'm barely a vet. You know, I'm just a glorified vet, really. I've worked in the commercial veterinary sector. sector sorry. And they said, well, as somebody who knows very little about it, you can bring fresh perspectives to the field. And he ended up teaching the best course on veterinary public health. So I, I've got the same thing going on. I'm dealing with the best practitioners in the cybersecurity industry without a world of doubt, uh, without a shadow of doubt, I should say, but I know very little of it. So coming back to your question and uh, what Sheena said just before about Star Trek, let me say two things about Star Trek. Um, when you look at all the gadgets and the technology that they were using, it shouldn't be the phenomenon of this. Uh, well, imagine if Scotty was and Zulu and Kirk and all the rest of them were just actually talking about the gadgets that they were using and how physics works and everything else. No one would pay attention. What made Star Trek so interesting is during the 1960s, we're living in a tumultuous time of the Vietnam War. We're living with all this racism. We're living with the, you know, the assassination of the Kennedy brothers, the assassination of Martin Luther King. And then you see, um, who, who, what's the name again? Uh, you, Lieutenant Uhura Communications. You see an Asian person, you know, the, 
looking after the or whatever Mr. Suley does. Uh, even I'm not too sure what Mr. Suley does. He just pushes a button to make the thing go faster. But that, you, you know what I'm saying here? So we can take the analogy of Star Trek and be absolutely overloaded, eyes glazing over with what actually goes on technologically, what warp speed means, what, um, you know, this... Uh, transporting people around, they dissolve in one place and materialize in another. Or we can look at the underpinning message of people cooperating to explore new frontiers. So cyber security and technology is exactly the same. Now, I, I want to say two things about uh, the, the Star Trek analogy. A lot of people, including the head of NASA, I think, started off being a Star Trek fan, the first woman of color. In, in space, uh, Mae Jemison was inspired by Uhura and became a great friend of the actress who played her. And of course, when we look at that Spock, Kirk, McCoy dynamic, people say, my goodness, it's the relationship between the yid, the ego, the super ego. These three people represent the human being. So um, I don't know how well that answers your question because it's such a well-rounded one. You could just about write a book on it and then you can't. You know, it's a, it's a phenomenal question you've asked me. But if I could bring it back to we've got to humanize the field. We've got to humanize everything. That's where the art comes into it. And, and that's where we've got to fuse the technical knowledge that we have and present it in such a way, two things. One is you instantly see the humanity of it. And then you also see the going forward with it. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. The final answers have to be, you know, uh, devised by humans. Uh, mm. Technology could be a monster and we have yeah. to tame that monster. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I'll come back to Pankaj, please. Uh, data breach is an issue for the judicial system in India and anywhere else in the world. At the same time, the judicial system has to protect the data of the general public too. The right to privacy is a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. But there's always a danger of leak of data, creation of inaccurate data, and even exploitation of correct uh, data by unauthorized third parties. What is the judicial stand mm -hmm. on privacy of data, breach of data, and punishment on any crime related to data breach? Yes, hi. It's a good question. Judiciary has recognized the Supreme Court judgment is there. Supreme Court has recognized the right to privacy. So everybody has a right to privacy. Now the question arises, okay, when you approach a judicial forum, so you share your data with judiciary. Once you share your data with judiciary, now whether it becomes in public domain, or the data is in private domain. Now, we kindly understand how our judicial system works. Our judicial system works on transparency. That means anybody can go and watch the court proceedings, be it a lower court, be it a high court or a Supreme Court. You can watch the judicial proceedings. So once, unless and until a case has been adjudicated by the judiciary to be heard in camera, in camera means to be heard in private, if a case has been recognized to be heard in camera, then only the part parties to the litigation can only hear those cases. Otherwise, all cases can be heard and can be seen by public at large. So that is why Indian judiciary, there is transparency. Point of the matter now remains that when prior to this digitization, everybody and anybody could have access to the court record and see the court record. That's called inspection was available, provided you have a kalatama. In decided cases, anybody can see the cases which were pending in the courts, only the litigating parties can see the court files. Now, there is also there is also protection there because there were cases when you file your original documents, like your title deeds to a property, your will, your other agreements. So there are chances the other party against whom those documents are, he can remove those documents from the court file. So there is there was there was there are directions from the high court, there are rules by the Supreme Court that you can keep your documents in something called seal cover. So you can keep your private documents in seal cover, which will not have access to people. Now, then came the judicial e-filing of the documents. 
now e filing of the document is there so these are only copies of the document you tend to retain the original documents with you so chances of your original document getting misplaced from judicial courts are actually becoming minimum but yes your data gets exposed to the public it can be misused i'll tell you i'll share a case with you know there was a litigation going on between a wife and a husband now wife was claiming maintenance from the husband so what husband did was so she was filing e filing her income tax returns not to the husband wanted to know the wife was claiming i don't have any source of income the husband was saying no she had a source of income so what he did was he hacked he hacked the it site because there is e filing of in, uh, income tax returns he took out that data of her income last 3 years income tax return and he produced before the court showing that no 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 she is lying these are her last 3 years income tax returns please see she is concealing she is earning so why should i pay her maintenance got access to that data how he got the data ultimately i was representing the wife we filed an fir against the husband he, he had the income tax site he admitted the case and an fir was registered against husband for hacking the site and taking out data maliciously so there are safeguards ultimately now because there are no judic judicially recognized privacy but fact of the matter is we are still governed the the datas all those video conferences are still governed by it information technology act now information technology act provides both for compensation as well as for conviction if you are guilty of stealing privacy if you are guilty of hacking so definitely you can be convicted it's called criminal prosecution you can be convicted at the same time if your conduct has resulted some some harassment some inconvenience some hardship to the to another party then you are also entitled to compensation under judicial under income tax uh, sorry under the it act so yes judiciary definitely there are safeguards you cannot access the court data directly but yes hacking is there there are means by which you can hack the data but that was earlier also you can go to the court you pay a bribe to those court staff and you could take out photocopies of the file but it happens it happened earlier also but chances are that if you use that data which you have procured through illegal means and if you try to use that data then it will backfire you you can be arrested there can be an fir against you and if so, i may also add uh, to that yeah, please oh, sorry about this so in my current role i am also uh, sort of uh, a part of the digital personal data protection committee which is working with the government on drafting this whole bill so so one is of course i mean what you mentioned around this whole um, you know uh, custody and access to data whether uh, but fundamentally it's to do with the personal data protection the personal data basically means um anything which has pii which is personally identifiable information through which somebody can reconstruct your identity uh you know uh, on the social media or on the digital channels then that is not allowed especially without the consent of the person so you have to expressly uh, seek the consent of the of the of the data subject or the person who whose data you plan to use and if you are able to seek that consent then you are allowed to use it or if you also are able to anonymize uh, the data and use it as an aggregated data even that is something that is currently allowed within the system because the it information act information technology act uh, probably does not apply of course i mean mr seth is far more <laughs> knowledgeable on the subject but from a business user point of view is what i'm trying to say uh, these are some of the other dimensions which are coming up uh, you know so the social and digital data which actually captures several types of information about a particular person needs to be handled with care each of the people have a right of uh, information to what kind of data somebody holds about them and hopefully if that comes into play uh, in the upcoming session then it would i understand would become a law is that correct mr singh that's how it is right yes. i tell you what you know when you litigate before a court right. of law you share information it's personal information there are professional information you share with the court now 
the point remains when once you share the information your case set up your case on the information you share before the court of law then when the court adjudicates upon that case when the court decides upon that case so that becomes a judicial precedent we say right. supreme court has said this supreme court has said that high court has said that that's why it's become a law under article 141 of the indian constitution anything said by the supreme court is the law of the land so it is the law is not statutory law or a codified law so law is like by, by law precedents also what judicial dictums what judicial precedents say so once the supreme court adjudicates upon your dispute this was your case you have shared your personal data the other party has shared the personal data the supreme court adjudicates upon it decides a case now that becomes a judgment now when it becomes a judgment it becomes the law of the land also so yeah. a case having similar facts and circumstances so the other party who has won that case or relies upon their case will be definitely quoting the data and the the facts of that case in his own case stating that because in the given facts supreme court has held like this so in my case also the lower court and the high court should are bound by the law later not only high court everybody is bound by whatever the high supreme court has said right. a a judgment of the high court is binding on that state of which that high court is a supreme court is binding on the entire nation so once your data you share and you get adjudication upon your data on your so so it comes within public domain the supreme court writes an order on that it becomes a judicial precedent and it is it is it becomes binding on not only on the parties but to the entire public at large in india so in the article 141 it it becomes a judicial precedent so my point of matter is ki yes once you bring the data within public domain within a judicial domain so unless until court says that ki no this this data will remain private otherwise it remains in the public domain and tell you a case now there was a cause of concern which occurred because there were aids cases now there a person who had aids he concealed that fact he went to the he did some wrong acts so there was a litigation filed against him stating that he, this person was suffering from aids he did not disclose this fact now these are very sensitive informations yeah. now if his name is revealed in the case now his reputation gets harmed so what the courts do in such type of cases they conceal the name and they give him some fictitious name like mr x versus mr y not only that now we have seen that uh, this nirbhaya case happened this rape cases happen uh offenses against women which happen now judicial yeah, no, no, no. understands that the name of the victim if it is publicized if it is it is reflected in the judicial order then that tarnishes a women's image in the society so judiciary does takes its protection by not naming her so we don't know nirbhaya case is there it is journal name which are given or a fictitious name given to the parties to protect the personal identities of victims of rape or of victims of this acid or other women who face her but but there are cases where if parties deliberately disclose their name disclose their identities and when a judicial order comes so once a judicial order comes it it becomes the law of the land when it becomes a law of the land the parties have a right to read it everybody has a right to read it and address this problem so that is why then the data gets shared so only the identity of the victims are being protected and judiciary does try to protect the identity of the victim not only that you can also request the court to hide the identities to not disclose the identities in judicial orders you understand thank you yeah we understand and it was really interesting to hear your point of view and to really get an insight into your world and you know for me mm -hmm. it's an interest to see these different worlds come together and it's very interesting to see how technology how through technology the effects you can have and of course each of your view points and how that creates like eventually i really feel that it's about using the medium more responsibly and creating the best effects we can in a more responsible manner <laughs> yeah. I, i think pravin has something yeah, you know yeah. in his mind yeah he raised it yes pravin i have to go for an event at sahara star but i just wanted to say please excuse me and but thank you so much it was an honor being here and i really enjoyed yes, being nice part of it. 
Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I understand. Yes, you shared with me before also. Thank you for joining in. See you. Okay. Yeah. See you. Bye. Yes, see you. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Yes, Pravin, please. Yeah, and yeah, I have a question regarding data privacy. If uh, I, I'll give you the my, my personal example, and uh, I got my son admitted in one of the prominent uh, institute for a coaching, and then what happens? Uh, but I feel that that data was shared between the different uh, educational uh, institutes and. I got a, so many calls, so many references, so many mails from all those institutes, and that uh, I should feel how 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 they get uh, my personal details that I have a son and he is in class twelve and he is going to make it to some good colleges. So that you, you never know who has shared that data. You, you you have got some idea, but you have given the data to your uh, few institutes, but it was shared among so many of institutes. Another example I can give you. And uh, I used to get a call from the banks that uh, said we are going to provide the loan against your car. How do they know I, I own a car? And even they know the make and the brand. So, so I, but what I feel that it's very difficult to uh, uh, to, to check that uh, data privacy. So, if uh, maybe Pankaj wants to take up the answer, or Mr. Sandeep Arora, please you sue them. You know, you should not tolerate. You know, you should sue them. Please, I've done these cases. You know what happened? My my client was running a website. On the website, he was uh, he was organizing treks, motorbike treks. Now there was somebody who was writing abuses on his website, passing wrong messages, and really very unparliamentary language was being used against him. Now he approached the police, and you know, police doesn't take action, and nothing happened. What 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 are the remedies available to me? So I told him that there are there are there is a process. If the police doesn't hear you out, then you can directly approach the court and get the FIR registered. So we approached the court. The court we said we don't believe in local police. Now court there is something called cyber crime cell. A cyber crime cell takes care of these these online offenses, cyber crime. So court issued notice to the cyber crime cell. Cyber crime cell came with an instruction that we have already registered the FIR. And we are going to arrest that person on the next date. We have identified from which server it was being used. So he was arrested. They can please understand every wrong has a remedy. There is no wrong which is remedyless. The courts will yeah. go out of the way to give you remedy against the wrong. If it pricks the conscience of the court and you take a defense, you know it is within not within the ambit of the judiciary, then the judge will go out of the way to give to give relief. To a person to whom a wrong has been committed. Only difficulty is if you do not respect your right, the court will not respect your right. Also, you have to approach the judiciary for for redressal of your grievances, of your wrongs, of your harassments. Yeah. Very interesting. Your iron grip on the you know subjects of mm. data legality is awesome. Uh, I guess you must come to more of our panel discussions, and we must uh, listen to you more. Thank you very much for your answer. And Thank then, you. You should remember law is simple. Every wrong has a remedy. If a wrong has been done to you, approach. You will get your remedies. No wrong under law cannot can be remedied. That's a simple law of be it India, be it Australia, be it anywhere in the world, you'll get remedies for your wrong. Yeah, Pankajji, I have a question. As an ordinary citizen of India, and an ordinary citizen can fight with the business giants in yes. uh, for the data privacy. Yes, uh, it's very very difficult. It's no, very difficult. the theoretical answer is yes. You can. You just have to lodge yeah, a complaint. I can. I Go can. I can. Would I? Would I? Would I be able to compete with them? Yeah, I'm you don't. Me. Please understand. Everything has its own cost. Just simply, my some personal data, very small personal data, is shared on a public platform, and it's very it takes a courage, time, your time, money. You have to you have to devote all these things. Then only you can shoot them. I'll, I'll explain you. You know, please understand the dis difference between a civil litigation and a criminal litigation. In civil litigation, parties litigate in person. That means you A litigates against B. In a criminal litigation, the state litigates litig litigates against the accused. So a wrong has been done to you, a criminal wrong has been done to you, you have to approach the state like an FIR 
police registered the FIR, the, the, the state takes up the onus to defend you and to prosecute and convict him. This whole machinery of the states come into action once an FIR registered or a police complaint is given. So why do you think you're a poor litigant? The states takes the onus upon you to redress your wrong. That's why the criminal justice system is there. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll please come back to Mr. Sandeep. Uh, yes. Sir, um, you and other panelists have already discussed about many phases of technology and uh, how they impact human directly or indirectly. Uh, as uh, technology is developing at a never before pace, good and bad uses of artificial intelligence and Internet of Things have become evident. More aspects would emerge gradually in the future. Humans develop technology for ease of life. To some extent, it is correct. However, we can take simple examples of a calculator or uh, the contact list of uh, our mobile phones. Humans can handle basic mathematics without cal a calculator or memorize names of people uh, and their phone numbers without the contact list. However, we are increasingly being dependent on technology. We can take complex examples too. Technology is being used to change backgrounds, voices, and appearances, uh, you know, uh, of our uh, appearances in video calls. Technology is being used to create more and more advanced weapons. Uh, so we must understand that technology is good in a limited sense. Uh, in the long run, it may be uh, disastrous. So in the end, uh, wouldn't technology cost us our freedom? values, privacy, or, uh, and normalcy in varying degrees. For that, uh, shouldn't technological advancements be controlled and uh, monitored? And uh, uh, who would do that? Will we end up using technology to control technology? <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> so I mean, you know, I'll just start with a small anecdote I was reading the other day. So somebody said that, you know, Amsterdam is the world's um, sin capital and sin city. <laughs> and somebody asked the mayor that, why is Amsterdam the sin city of the world? And the mayor said, no, this is not correct. Amsterdam is the world's freedom city. We allow anybody to do whatever they want. However, it's unfortunate that people choose to do sin. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are not asking you to do sin. It's just that you have chosen to do sin. For me, I mean, technology was free. So technology is there. Now you could actually use it to your advantage or you can use it to harm others. It's really up to us at one yeah. level, yeah. right? So that is one mm -hmm. sort of a point. Second point, which I think is there is that <clears throat> just because I'm not able to remember the phone numbers of my relatives, does it does it not make me closer to them anymore or do i not call them uh, enough now now that i don't remember their phone numbers that's not correct no i still call my relatives i still talk to my parents uh, you know even though i don't remember their number so i am basically using technology to help me free up my memory and do things which i should be doing versus wasting my very limited memory into doing things with something else can do. Why should I really spend time, my effort, and other things on that? Or let's say if after the automated transmission in car has come in, uh, and after we have switched to automated transmission from manual transmission, what has changed? Nothing has changed. Have we learned any? I mean, are we doing uh, any more accidents? No. On the contrary, we're doing less accidents. Technology is helping us focus our energy to do what we have to do. So therefore, while I'm driving, because I have the convenience, I can do something else. So that's really the second point, which is how do you sort of use it? And third point, in my opinion, when it comes to technology is really <clears throat> about the fact that, that we should never understand, underestimate the power of humanity or of humans. Humans who have created technology this is not the first time we have created technology. Technology has always been, been created, but we have managed to overcome the challenges of it. So this time again, we'll overcome uh, the same challenges. There are very, very advanced missile systems which are there, but we also have missile defense systems made by us, right? 
which are able to catch those advanced missiles and stop them midway. So there would always be people who would be there to destroy or use it to a disadvantage. But I personally feel overall humanity is clever and overall majority of the humans want to survive to the next sort of generation. So they will certainly come up with something which will help us sort of take over it. So we should just live with the times, just enjoy the journey and, um, and, uh, and not be too worried. Too much of analysis leads to paralysis. <laughs> so let's just <laughs> be cautious and move ahead. Really profound answer, indeed. <laughs> yeah, it's like walking on the edge. You have to keep your you know, balance uh, and avoid um, slipping while keep walking. Thank you. Yeah, that is that. But of course, I mean, we have to use it to move ahead. So therefore, it's a leverage for us to jump ahead. So yeah. Right. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll come back to uh, Praveen. Um, we have been discussing how technology is the base of uh, all advancements in the world. Uh, we must also note that engineering is the base of all technology. Um, if some technology is based on uh, some software, the software must be first created by some software engineers. Uh, even if we talk about advancements in medical technology, at the base are engineers who are creating that technology. So at the end, how technology is affecting humans comes down to how humans are affecting technology. How technology is affecting human values comes down to how human values are affecting technology. Um, that is, technology is not good or bad for anyone. Uh, first, the decision makers uh, and leaders must ensure no breach of freedom, <laughs> values, privacy, and normalcy is taking place. And then every user of technology must reassure, reassure no bad use of technology is taking place. So uh, is it a simple case of engineers taking care of human freedom, values, privacy, and normalcy? Or the complex case of who finally takes decisions on using any freedom, uh, any form of uh, form, uh, um, I'll just repeat it. Um, so is it uh, a simple case of engineers taking care of human freedom, values, privacy, and normalcy, or the complex case of uh, who finally takes decisions on using any form and type of technology? Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Uh, basically, uh, engineers do play a crucial role in developing uh, and implementing technologies. But the question is, the ultimately, uh, who are the agencies? those engage those engineers to evolve a technology for their advantage for their business so engineers can uh, provide the basic solutions to make the life of ordinary people easy but ultimately the, uh, the question lies with the agency who has given the task to the engineer and for the what purpose this technology will be used is lies with the agency not with the engineers and if you talk about the human values and the individual privacy, I'll tell you it's not about the engineer. They they always always create a, some kind of a new new technology ultimately to make the uh, people of uh, life of the people simple and easier. So the, the human values and individual privacy always comes into play when uh, while designing the technologies. But ultimately, the, uh, the agency who has created all those technology, who is going to ultimately use this technology, whether it is uh, for the advantage of the people or disadvantage, it's all up to them. So what we need, we need a, a very uh, collaborative uh, kind of a system in which each and every stakeholders have some responsibility, whether it's the engineers or the agency or ultimately the people. If people reject some kind of technology, if they don't use them, then there will be a setback to the engineers and the agency. So it's a collaborative, uh, collaborative effort by the all three stakeholders so that the, uh, the technology which the engineers have involved is can be utilized on optimum level. You're absolutely right. Everything comes down to human decisions. And yeah. you know, technologies are being created by humans. So if we create well, um, then keeping in mind the importance of human freedom and values, privacy, and, and normalcy, we don't have to worry about this later. Thank you. Um, now I'll finally come back to Adam. Uh, you 
come from one of the best countries to live in. The judicial, administrative, financial, and social systems are more developed than most other countries in the world. The technological advancements are much ahead of most other countries in the world. The world of freedom, values, privacy, and normalcy we have been discussing is much better in your country. Uh, maybe you have already experienced what we are experiencing now. But uh, let's take a neutral view. Let's uh, remove the background of technological advancements of one country over other. What is your gut feeling? What may happen in the gradual wars of technology versus humanity? What may happen in the final battle of technology versus humanity? Mm. Um, going back, I, I like what uh, everyone has said. It's been really enlightening. But going back to what Sandeep said about this and, and what I said earlier about the simple business of seeing technology as a way of moving forward and people essentially want to survive. Uh, we essentially want um, the, the, the next generation to do better than we did. It's just this whole process of humanity moving forward. Um, but the other thing is, as well, uh, is that we can't see technology in isolation from education. And then what is education? It's uh, uh, gathering information, turning that into knowledge, and then hopefully processing the knowledge into wisdom and helping us organize our stay on the planet. So as well as scientific dimensions, it's the same as uh, not, not just, I alluded to Star Trek before, but indeed any kind of travel. Um, sailing, for example, discovering new, new lands or going on any journey to, to discover new territories doesn't just involve the technical and the scientific dimensions. It also involves human values of cooperation, language and communication and so forth. So hand in hand with that, um, it, it, I think somebody mentioned trust, uh, forgive me if I didn't remember who, but I want to go back to the um, APEC conference here in New Zealand, the last one, which was um, during the pandemic. I was very fortunate to be invited, but it was all virtual. And uh, one of the uh, coordinators was an AI avatar that you'd think was as human as you or I. And that just shows how amazing it was. It's, it's quite strange. You're actually taking instructions and being directed to all the different forums and all the different carrying on. Like our, at the time, our then Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, was speaking with Angela Merkel, the outgoing Chancellor of Germany and the Vice President of Microsoft. And this was phenomenal in, in a context exactly like this. If there were no pandemic, there would have been blocked streets, traffic jams, helicopters going on, um, probably different tiers of what it would have cost to go and see those sorts of uh, um, conferences. But be all that as it may, with the wealth of information and, um, and with the wealth of things that were discussed, the most pressing issue for APEC was trust, because we're dealing with disinformation now, that's another thing. And another major problem, people being able to take other people's identities and say, look, say for argument's sake, uh, Mr. Sandeep uh, endorses uh, Bitcoin uh, trading or whatever, so, and that, that, that literally happens. And you're thinking, well, and it looks so real with Mr. Sandeep smiling and I made uh, X amount of money on, and, and Sandy was sitting there going, hey, who did that? What? You know? So, so uh, and, and in politics, everything. So the whole issue comes back to how do we promulgate trust? So what you will find, it's not a case of technology, as Sandy again alluded to before, it, it's more of a tool for human survival. But one of the things we're going to be finding is that inserted within to that, in that technology, for example, is not just the issue of firewalls to stop phishing, but the training of the human mind to, to identify online manipulation. Sitting in the same room, we might have a gut feeling or enough psychological training to discern whether the other person is, um, you know, not trustworthy 
online it's a different matter. So we're going to have to need a corresponding psychological training to avoid being manipulated online, you know, and that will be inserted into the technology. That, that will become another dimension of cybersecurity. So again, I actually see a very bright future because we either sink together or swim together. Whatever we do, we do together as a human family. And with technology, we are drawing together closer and closer as a human community. And with that presents the challenge of uh, do we all break into factions and do we all break down as a society and see hate crimes rising, see disinformation rising, greater gaps between rich and poor and so forth, um, wars over things like water, or can we get together in contexts such as this, taking advantage of the smart technology and come up with solutions? And again, as Mr. Seth has said, um, for every problem, there's a solution. So, and and um, so, I hope that answer wasn't too long, but um, it's been a very, very enlightening session. And thank you, thank you all for that. Thank you, Adam. I feel that sums it up all in the end. <laughs> and yes, technology is like uh, giving humans the ability to fly, run faster, reduce uh, daily stresses, and enhance the human power. Mm -hmm. uh, capabilities and possibilities. Um, what was not even thinkable yesterday uh, is very much possible today, only because of technology. However, um, it's a collective responsibility to watch over the misuse uh, and, and uh, abuse of technology while harnessing it carefully and indigenously to make the best out of it. Till technology and humanity are friends and we keep it that way by force or understanding all would be well else we have all discussed today that out of control technology would transform into an uh, untamable monster uh, it was a great uh, you know session dis discussing with all of you uh, what wonderful and insightful ideas we created today uh, i would like to conclude this panel discussion now best wishes to everyone thank, thank you so much Thank very you. nice to meet you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you very much, all esteemed panelists, for a detailed and thought-provoking panel discussion. Uh, now I would like to present to you my question-answer session with Dr. Alfredo Spierunis, which you recorded earlier. Dr. Alfredo Spierunis is the presidential candidate of Chile, former director of World Bank, and a pre special representative of the United Nations. Today, we have Dr. Alfredo Spierunis with us. He's from Chile. He is the president of the Zambuling Institute for Human Transformation, an organization dedicated towards creating a grassroots world forum on human rights and human responsibilities and uh, mainstream spirituality in public policy and business. We will learn about Dr. Alfredo's personal and professional passions, his highly impactful and rewarding thoughts and philosophies, and the promises he holds in his heart for himself and countless others out there in the world, all through a session of questions and answers. Hello, Dr. Alfredo. How are you? Hello. How are you? Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very happy to be with you and all your audience. I'm fine. Thank you. Let's start with the question straight. I would try to paint a canvas for our viewers with several bright and inspiring colors of your highly impactful and highly inspirational professional life. Uh, our viewers seek inspiration from personal challenges and triumphs too. So I would also slightly touch upon your uh, personal life and future aspirations, please. Please tell us about yourself in your own words for our viewers. Well, first of all, as you said, I'm from Chile. I was born from a family of migrant people from Lebanon. I am a third generation of Lebanese, actually, because that's my last name, Esfir Yunis. Uh, 
as regards my family itself, we are five children in, in my family. And I'm the second one with all the positive and negative of being the second one in the family. <laughs> uh, my education was a Catholic education with the Jesuits in Chile. Then I went to the University of Chile to study economics. And then I did a master and a PhD in economics and environmental economics at the University of Wisconsin in the United States. With regard to, to myself, I like a lot at the time, not now, to play soccer, riding horses, uh, but always I was pulled by the spirit. Something was always telling me there is something beyond. So I, I had a quite a productive spiritual life, including deep, deep practice and, and studying of Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay. Uh, and uh, I also love politics since I was very young. Actually, I was president of my high school then I became president of the School of Economics. And then I got into public politics, which we might talk about it later on. But uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, I am the president and founder of the Sambolin Institute for Human Transformation. I am a senior vice president of the International Association of Educators for World Peace. I'm also a chancellor for them in Chile. I am uh, an ambassador. Uh, for the Lama Ganshin World Peace Foundation at the United Nations, and so on and so on. But I'm a happy man. I'm happy to be in this lifetime, and I'm trying to do the best for not only for me, but for everyone. Lovely. Dr. Alfredo, it's interesting to know about your Lebanese background, the spiritual inclination and love of politics. No doubt, your academic and professional achievements are highly impressive. I'm extremely happy to be interacting with you. Moving ahead while exploring different aspects of your personality, I would like to ask you my second question. Uh, you are currently the president of the Zambling Institute for Human Transformation, founded in 2005 in Washington, DC. What is uh, your institute all about? Please share. Uh, the institute is a very small foundation. Actually, the foundation funds come from my own salary. I'm a retired person now. Okay. Uh, and the idea is human transformation. And human transformation is not directly related to education, to diplomas, to professional you know, life. It, it goes beyond that. So the Institute recognizes a lot of people who has never gone to school and they're a source of transformation in their villages, in their towns, in their, in their surrounding, in their neighborhoods. Also, we have recognized national parks which nature recognized nature as a power source of human transformation. And so we don't have buildings, we don't have places to go, we don't have uh, staff because we don't want to spend time in overheads. Maybe in the future we'll do more than that. The essence of it is, is what I call the yoga of earth, Nelyor Sa in Tibetan. And if you want to know more about the Institute, you go to nelyorsa.com. N E L J O R S A dot com. Nerjor Sa means yoga of the earth in Tibetan. And we are dealing with peace, with healing the planet, with the spirituality in public policy. That means in business, politics, economics, social, institutional. We are trying to create a new vision with all of us, you, everyone included. What, what is that vision within now? We look essentially for, for the collective, not only the individual transformation, but collective transformation, which is a different thing altogether. And this collective is not only about human beings, it's a collective of sentient beings and nature. This is the, 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 the basis of collective for the Zambulin Institute. Okay. And we are now, most of all, dealing with the planetary collective. Okay. So we write books, we, we do a lot of things. The latest book is on conscious sustainability leadership, which is in, in Amazon. Great. What a wonderful initiative of global human transformation. More and more people on the globe must know about your efforts and philosophies. More and more uh, people must join heads and hands and collectively, we all make a positive difference in the world. Continuing uh, to explore your global efforts towards a better world, 
Um, I know that uh, you took your first efforts towards making a global impact several decades back. Uh, you were hired by the World Bank in 1976 as the first environmental economist, a natural resource economist. Later, you were appointed as a, a director of the World Bank um, in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, on the whole, you worked with the World Bank for 29 long years. Uh, please share your experience with the World Bank. Thank you very much. Very nice question, actually. <laughs> I, I went to the World Bank when I was very young. I was 28 years old. And there was a program called the Young Professionals Program that enabled young people to enter directly at the World Bank and not as assistants or you know summer interns, but, but fully fledged professionals. They took care of us for years and then we, we grew up in the bank. We were, there were 6,000 people that year postulating to 14 slots only. And I was good and lucky enough to get one of those 14 positions. I began uh, as the first natural resource economist and people didn't know what that was. Actually, it was an experiment. I was told we are hiring you as an experiment. We think you do geography, you do this. And I didn't do that, I did economics an ecology which now is very well known, but we are talking about several decades ago. My work began in South Asia, in India, in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, oh. in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, and I was taught how to be an economist at the World Bank those years, you know, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the policy side, that is to say, to to write policy uh, papers. In I wrote papers on world policies on fisheries forestry, biodiversity, desertification, land management. I did studies about the national environmental action plans at the time that countries had renewable energy and so on. Then I moved to Africa. I was I worked in Africa as the senior agricultural economist for West African countries, the French speaking countries like Senegal, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mauritania. Then I went back to the operations evaluation department where I studied projects that had been completed to look at the experience, whether good, bad, where failures or not. So I spent several years and I wrote my first piece on sustainable development in 1987. Then after all of that, the bank said, we need someone at the UN, you know? And I was entitled the special representative to the UN from the World Bank. And I did a lot of work, but particularly uh, enlightening for me uh, was the, the issue of Commission on Human Rights. The bank had a very bad name at the time. And so I had to really get in there. And one of the things we did was right to development, which was a new concept that even today, people are not using it very much. Mm -hmm. I brought spirituality into public concerns. We dealt with public goods and then I came back to the bank in 2003 to end my career in 2005, dealing with the policy of human rights and financial aid in the world at large. All right. So it's a big, big career, very supported. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. I know the good, the bad and the ugly of an institution like that, but as a person, uh, I couldn't have asked for better in my life in a sense I, I met so many people around the world. I visit so many countries like India. That is unforgettable. That is essential in my life to have been in India. So that was part of the, the whole process. And then after the bank, I continue doing things, but not related to the calculus, the mathematics of economics, but dealing with the ethical issues that are brought by the way we do economics. Wow. Your association and work in so many countries and different parts of the world is really impressive. I'm sure uh, ethics, economics, and ecology uh, together would be enlightening for everyone. Top leaders must take a note. As you just mentioned about the World Bank sending you as a special representative to the UN, I would like to ask you about that. You have served as a special representative to the United Nations and uh, World Trade Organization from 1996 to 1999, uh, working in the general spheres of uh, human rights, peace, and social justice. Uh, 
actually your work during these uh, years for the UN and the WTO included vast, comprehensive and impressive initiatives and endeavors. Uh, please share about your work for the benefit of our viewers. For me to have been nominated the bridge between a financial institution and a global social institution was like a ring for my finger. It was perfect. Uh, there's a lot of politics in it. There is a lot of uh, social issues, community issues, citizens and issues. So for me, it was a great honor. It was a time when the process of globalization began very strongly and the bank was heavily criticized by its conditionality of lending, you know, conditions for countries to receive money, moving towards neoliberalism, which is not my position in economics or in politics. So it was very good, you know, and it was the era of Boutros Boutros Ghali, Egyptian Secretary General, and then Kofi Annan from Ghana. You know, these were the two Secretary Generals which, which I interacted at the UN. Two very different, very intelligent people, you know, to lead the UN. So I spent a lot of time in the Commission on Human Rights and the Economic and Social Council, because there it was the debate on economics what to do, how to finance development, and so on. And one of the things that maybe people who are listening to this interview remember is the development goals. Somehow the countries agree on some global development goals for everyone, you know, and eliminate this fragmentation of the global commons, you know. This was very, very important. The global common means oceans, air, climate, biodiversity, security, and so on and so forth. So, I was like the bridging the gap and the understanding, the gap of understanding and the lack of democracy at the international level in ILO, International Labor Office, WHO, UNHCR, the refugees agencies with NGO and WTO. I brought to the, to the UN also a seminar on development, which now is a standard seminar where People from all over the world with different views, totally different views will discuss, debate, and fight for different views on development. I also was involved with many of the spiritual movements. In Geneva, the ecumenical movement, the ecumenical center. In New York, with all the NGOs, the, the World Council of Churches, you know, all sort of religion and so on. And I play an active role in the debate on economic, social, and cultural rights. That is the, the right of housing, the right of water, the, you know, the right of health, the right of education. I also did with multilateralism. Multilateralism means a group of countries trying to govern the world, but the group of countries being so different among themselves, defending their own self-interest. So there was a lot of debating on that. And uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And, it was a moment that is now very fresh, but it was the beginning of a seed of a transition between market-oriented societies to right-based societies, and we still are not adjusting. That is to say, education is not uh, like bread and butter we buy in the supermarket. No, education is a right for people. Well, how do you do it? How do you finance it? What do you do with it? And now people are saying, we have the right of a clean environment, we have the right of children, we have the right of women. So we're moving to these societies of rights. And I was at the beginning of that movement and I was very happy to do that. Great, how wonderful it is to know that uh, you have seen history in making and you have been part of the group of people making that history and shaping the globe. Um, you, have, oh, you have been working dedicatedly generally all over the globe and especially in Chile. You are a candidate for the presidential election in Chile in 2013 uh, as the leader of the Green Ecologist Party. Unfortunately, you lost the election. However, uh, please share your experience of the elections. What inspired you to run for the presidential election? There is one phrase that inspired me to run is to serve my country and serve humanity through that position. It was not some ego, frenzy, trying to get the oppression of Chile because it's, it's a tremendously uh, difficult and cumbersome position in public policy. I believe in politics. I believe in good politics. 
as the French say, the grand politique, you know, the, the, how to manage society, how to manage what is common to all of us. So I was interested in that, but most important, I wanted to change politics. I wanted to change the development paradigm. I wanted to change the way we were doing things in Chile, mm -hmm. you know, and the slogan and the program was sustainable development society okay. with empowered citizenship. Today we live the era of citizens. Mm -hmm. And so this paradigm meant to recognize not only technological constraints, but biological constraint, ecological constraint, okay. and to look for a balance between our inner ecology and the outer ecology. Mm -hmm. The other thing that motivated me is the youth and the future generations, women, the elder, you know, our indigenous people to bring about something that in India is very, very known and very powerful, the rural sector, rurality, as part of our roots, as part of our culture, as part of our, you know, tailor-made life. So essentially, if you say, why are you interested in this? Is service, seva, service. That's what interests me in politics. <clears throat> and I was involved in politics for many, many years. I also ran for the Senate, the country, Senate of the country in, in 2017. I also lost for very small margin but it was very, very good, very good experience. I think everyone should go into politics to do good politics because politics is like air. We need to breathe and, and we hope to breathe good air, you know? So if the good people leave politics, then we have nothing. There is no much to do in the, in the world. If everyone thinks that politics stinks, that politics is, you know, frustration, is money, is whatever, it doesn't matter to me is a responsibility to make a good contribution to policy and to politics. Definitely. Good politics is the need of the hour. Uh, there must be more good people at the top. They would surely work uh, not only for development, uh, but for sustainable development. You have worked extensively for sustainable development in developing countries. According to you, what must be done or what more must be done for true sustainable development? I believe that the first step, which might appear to be esoteric, and it's not esoteric, is we need in developing countries a big change in consciousness, a big change in recognizing the collective, that we are interdependent. You are not independent. I am not independent. Chile is not going to resolve the environmental issues, the sustainable development issues alone. We need to, to have a, a family of nations because these problems like pollutions of the ocean, uh, climate change, biodiversity depletion, the depletion of natural forest, the, the breakdown of cities, it's all of us are involved, you know? And here there is an issue of equity and justice because <coughs> the countries that pollute more, they do less. And they ask us developing countries to do more when we pollute less. So we need, a, we need a change in values. We are now into this society of materialism and individualism. Compete, compete, compete. Unfortunately, the solution to the environmental and sustainable development problems depend on collective action. And this collective action must come to, to happen now and now nature Sorry. No problem. Please take your we need, time. We need a big change in governance. You know, we need a big change in governance. We need be a big change in institutions to bring institutions closer to the people. Because the ones who are going to manage natural forests best is the people, it's not the government. So sustainable development can be understood in many different ways. One, as a stage of development. First growth, how much and how fast the economy grow, like how much and how fast the pie grows. This, then we went into social economic development, not only the pie, but who eats the pie was an issue of equity. And then sustainable development, which is not only how fast the pie grows, who eats the pie, but how long the pie lasts. And so we enter into that era of sustainable development, but also sustainable development 
It's a collection of rights. It's a structure of power. It's a collection of values. And finally, sustainable development is a state of the self. It's not something, a word, it's not a phrase, it's not something that, wow, sustainable development, no. You have to self-realize sustainable development yourself. For example, I self-realized not long ago, a few decades, but not long ago, that the earth is not a thing, that the earth is a living being, and that we are part of this matrix of all form of life. And this is something that is not esoteric, is the true reality of what we live now. So we need a big change in governance based on citizenship. And all of these changes we have to do now, we cannot wait any longer. Absolutely. You have brought forward two very important aspects uh, for sustainable development, self-realization and bringing changes immediately. Yes. If we don't realize it ourselves and do not think and act towards it and wait for someone else to uh, take the lead, sustainable development will never be achieved. Um, you have been working for it relentlessly for decades. Actually, you have prepared a proposal to create a bank for indigenous people. Please share with us about this proposal. When I left the World Bank, I learned that the demand for loans from the World Bank by countries, the demand for loans of average citizens like you and me, were very different to the structure of demand. That is to say what they want, what they need from indigenous people. Second, there was not a banking system except for the Grameen Bank of Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh that really was focused on, on a different reality. Uh, uh, Grameen Bank was focusing on poverty. The essence was poverty and women and very successful. The idea that I had was indigenous people, men, women, children, and poverty and development. And so the idea was to create a World Bank for indigenous peoples. And we did a lot of work, you know, uh, about collateral. Collateral not being money, money for money, but nature being the collateral of this, of this bank. You don't have money, but you have water. You have a river, you have trees, you have so many things. So I work a lot on them with several consultants from indigenous nations, but then it did not went to fruition. This is an idea that is still floating, but it never happened because the startup money was taken away because, you know, this is a big thing to have another World Bank, but for indigenous people. This has to happen, eventually it has to happen. In India, there are many tribes, you know, the tribal areas and so on. They consume different things, you know, they, they are not the same, you know, they, they, they are looking for a different path on their land, on their housing, on their, on their villages. So it's not the same Kabul button that is in another place near New Delhi or near Bombay. It's, it's a totally different world. So that's the idea of the, the Bank for Indigenous People. And I hope it, it sooner or later happens like it is happening the, the, the Ethic Bank and many other banks. It will become a reality, I'm sure. A bank for indigenous people should become a reality in every country. Uh, you have been really working hard for more than four decades now, and your efforts have bore sweet fruits in so many countries and uh, so many fields. Your exceptional work has been deservingly recognized by several international organizations too, by conferring upon you various honors. Uh, do such recognitions uh, inspire you to do more and bring a higher sense of responsibility? Of course, of course. You know, this is not a fashion show. When somebody says to you, here you have this peace award, it's a huge responsibility. I remember when, when I received the first award, I told this, this spiritual master who gave me an award that was entitled Lifetime Ambassador of Peace. Wow. And it was given only once. So 
I was the only one who would have taken that award. And I told the spiritual master, I said, master, but I have not done a lot for peace. You know, I know what I do, it contribute to this. He said, look, you need to not to worry about what you have not done, but you need to worry of what you will do in the future. And this award will open doors for you to really get involved. I was much younger than now. And so the awards mean like a drop of water when you are thirsty to keep walking, not to sit there and say, okay, I will drink all the bottle. No, you just keep going, bringing more people and becoming more responsible. But in the world of collective good, where peace is a collective good, security is a collective good. Look at what's happening in Ukraine, in Ukraine and Russia. It's a collective good. It's not like they are there and Chile is here and nothing matters. No, it could matter. You know, a, a nuclear weapon can do a lot of damage to the world. So, so we're talking about awards that were related to something very special in my life, which is the collective nature of life the collective nature of peace, the collective nature of poverty. And now I am fully engaged in creating this planetary future. For the first time in human history, humanity is living a planetary reality. This has never happened before. You and I are very lucky that this is happening in front of our eyes. If you want to tell your children and grandchildren what exactly was part of your essence is, the, the, is this planetary collective, is the collective nature of humanity with sentient beings and with nature. So I always realized when they gave me an award that I was part of a larger architecture. It was not me, 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 me. No, it, it, it was something else, you know, that I knew that I have to be part of the shared responsibilities that we have. Many people say, oh, no, this is the government. No, this is the private sector. No, this is economy. This is politics. No, it's not like that. So I have behind this award, this desire to bring coherence between your inner ecology and your outer ecology. And when I talk about your inner ecology, I talk about your consciousness, your values. You know, I talk about your inner self not in a collection of things. You're not a collection of things. You're not a, a, a sort of a, an engine of different physical systems. You are much, much more than that. And therefore, every time I receive an award, actually, it was very, very nice. And I said, okay, I keep going. You know, I keep going. But when you say I keep going, what you are saying is I'm taking more and more responsibilities. Right. You know, it's, it's not just going unconscious, you know, without understanding in a sort of present time, you know, mindfulness, mindful of the, the moment. And so that means more responsibility. I cannot live a life without responsibility. The moment I set in motion my purpose, automatically I enter into the space of self-responsibility. And if my, if my purpose is with you, then I enter into the collective part of myself, you know, this, this relationship that two is more than one plus one and, and four is more than two plus two. And that's the way the world needs to function now. And it is our responsibility that that functions. Really great. Yes, I understand that you are working hard even after your retirement, being more than 70 years of age. This is because you realize your responsibilities towards the world. If only everyone, uh, especially the younger generation would realize it, we would be able to make the world a much, much better place. Uh, talking about the world, how do you see the world before and after COVID-19 in terms of positives and negatives? COVID is a very unique situation for the world. We are in an inflection point. The inflection point means that or we go to the past again and, and use all our will, all our power to go to the past, or we build a new future. That's what COVID is asking us. And again, not a future as individuals, but a, a future as collective. 
So this is a time where many things have happened and I speak for myself and the people surrounding me, which are not few because I connect but with many people around the world, is that time went to, from infinity to zero. Many people were living with infinite time, tomorrow, tomorrow, next month. All of a sudden, the time is zero. The distance between our material life and death, it was reduced drastically, particularly for those who have had COVID, Death is something not out of the, the context, it's in the context. And it's not only about all people, it's about everyone. You know, it, it's, a, it's a moment that it requires, and today it requires a change in path. We need to change the path. We cannot stay put like victim of change. We have to be architect of, of change. So, but also, you know, the mistakes we make today, and this has to do with the law of karma, you know, it seems that we pay right away. It's like a shrunk, the period of forgiveness, the period of reconciliation. It seems that, wow, you do it, you get it, you know? So, but it's also a time of great opportunities. And we have to seize those opportunities. It's a time of reflection and meditation. Who am I? It's a time of recognition of many, many, many people, many moments, many things, you know, and the character of interdependent life is something that every school, every university is doing. You know, I, I can ask one question. The question is, what will happen if another COVID comes? Call it something else. Are we prepared for it? Or we are just, you know, uh, vaccinating ourselves and this is this is over. COVID, from a spiritual point of view, represent a collapse of our collective yoga, of our collective union. We have no adequate of collective consciousness to deal with COVID and things like COVID. I almost died of COVID. Oh. I was on the other side and I came back. And, and it's an incredible spiritual experience. It's an incredible emotional experience. It's not just a physical thing. This little COVID, you know, has something, this virus has something that reposition us to a time, life, and everything around us. Now, Sangasena, Venerable Sangasena, who is in Leh, in Northern India, in the Himalayas, right. he said that the responsibility we have now is to transform coronavirus into Karuna virus. Karuna is compassion, you know, to change coronavirus into Karuna. What a beautiful phrase. What a beautiful challenge, you know. Can we really go from this crazy life that is imposed by COVID, solitude, you know, uh, separation, uh, dislocation, social dislocation, personal dislocation, and bring a world of karuna? Are we ready to understand the intelligence of the immunity system and how it is being destroyed by our food system? You know, seeds that are not fertile. They're, they're GMOs, you know, basically, you know, the corn that you are eating, not in all India, because in India we still have traditional corn, but it's a corn that if you plant it again, if you keep the seed, it will not flourish anything. So if you are feeding people with infertile food, the result is infertility. So are we prepared? Are we prepared for the next shot? Are we prepared? I am not sure that we are prepared. You know, I think we, we love palliatives because we like to live with things immediate, particularly your generation. The, the one now, this is now. I, I have so many young people who tell me I want to retire at 40. Wow, I'm not retired, I'm 74, I'm not retired. I am more active than ever before. No, 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 I want this company, this entrepreneurship. I want to be an entrepreneur and, and tomorrow find this incredible gold coin and be the, 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 the best of all the, the entrepreneurs. Well, life might be like that, I don't know. It's not for me. 
but I know that time has shrunk from this infinity world. I will live tomorrow. No, every morning I pray that I, in gratitude for the fact that they gave me another day of life because I knew that I didn't have it. You know, so now every moment, like this moment, this interview to me is vital in my life. And I thank you for that to give me the microphone to send a new message to the world. It is our responsibility. Yes, it's our responsibility. And thanks to you two for sharing your message to the world through our platforms. Listening to you is so good. Uh, I feel I'm reading a great book. You have uh, just strengthened my feel belief, you know, uh, to never retire from trying to make my contribution towards making the world better. Thank you. I'm sure your philosophy and spirituality must have made you a very strong human being. What is the reason and philosophy behind the, uh, your transformation as a spiritual leader and healer? First uh, impulse, it was that we need to transcend the material world. Somehow uh, matter and the material world solutions for what is happening to us is not good enough. I felt it was not good enough. So I knew that I had to go beyond, beyond, I didn't know where, but I needed, I had this need of going beyond. This means our own transformation becomes our own responsibility. We are in the era of Aquarius. The era of Pisces ended. The, the, the golden rule of the era of Pisces is as I know, as I act. But in the era of Aquarius we are now, it is as I self-realize I act. So now it's our responsibility to walk the path. That means two things that are very fundamental in life and in spirituality, which is self-awakening. You know, we, we, it's not only someone else awakening, which is okay. I have my gurus, my teachers and so on. But at the same time, I needed a process of self-awakening all the time. Many people walk life and don't know what is beside them. They, they, they don't even look, they don't even understand what is going behind them. Second, self-governance. This is tremendously important. You know, that otherwise, if we had self-governance, that means we are not animals. We are, we are not living only by impulses, but by reflection, by meditation, by understanding, by practice, by self-realization. We need to govern. Otherwise, we live in the extremes all the time. The yes and no, you know, the black and white, the inner or the outer, the individual, the collective, the material, the spiritual. And we never find this third way, you know, this other way of doing things, which is not an average. It's not an average between the individual and the collective. No, it's another state. It's another space of reality. So I am also very committed, which what I call a social Buddhism or committed Buddhism. In simple word means that I'm not only to self-realize compassionate in myself, which is part of the self-awakening and self-governance, but at the same time, simultaneously, I had to commit myself to create a compassionate society. Okay. That is to say, it's not only, it's like a funnel upside down, you know? I do my practice, I go to the collective, I contribute to the collective, the con collective contributes to me, I come back to my individual part. Spirituality is not a silo. You know, my, my philosophy is not a silo philosophy that I sit here and say, oh, um, 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 um. it's okay. That is also okay, but it's not enough when we live now more than 7 billion people in the planet. You know, I have seen in my lifetime, the population double twice, you know? And so I'm not saying that it will double again in my lifetime because, you know, I don't know until when I will be in this planet, in beautiful planet, but essentially is this double purpose. I need to do the self-awakening and self-governance for love, compassion, whatever. But at the same time, I must commit myself, we must commit ourselves 
to create compassionate societies, loving societies. So that's why my entire life now is devoted to healing the planet for world peace. And from a very practical point of view, is my dream, you know, to create a, an, an institution of education to create bodhisattvas, to create planetary beings. Bodhisattva means that I look at my spiritual path and my achievements, like enlightenment, for example, not only as my own personal path, but through enlightening others, you know, seva, you know, uh, this road to enlightenment, it's a collective road now, it's not a, an individual road only. And that means an understanding of different forms of consciousness. And so that is what has inspired me and it keep inspiring me today as a philosophical, you know, base. And I follow and I read the scriptures, the Hindu scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures, the Jain scriptures, you know, the Sikh scriptures and so on, because I think just reading them, it has a tremendous transformational power, like it or not, self-realized or not, understand it or not, knowing it or not, it's a built-in seed of transformation. Absolutely right. Indian scriptures have uh, the ultimate power to completely transform a human being uh, in a positive way. Um, how has your transformation over the years and decades been? Which issues were close to your heart a few decades back? Which issues do you feel are still close to your heart? What should the world do more for these issues? Which you feel are close to your heart? Very profound question. You know, uh, it's a question that touches the fiber of human existence. I would say things that are relatively practical, relatively in the sense that it depends on where you are or what you want to do with your life. But the first thing that is still on, it's moving our human society from the having, the having, the accumulation, the attachment to the being and becoming, not only the being, but also becoming this very dynamic way of human existence. The second one, which is getting better, but not good enough, is to mainstream spirituality into politics, economic, business, and social. I said in my campaign, my presidential campaign, that politics without spirituality is a suicidal path. But a spirituality without politics, without the, the karma, you know, the action, mm -hmm. is a theoretical proposition. The same thing with economics. I wrote my first article on the foundations of spiritual economics more than 30 years ago, okay. and that was an earthquake. People were saying this is crazy. Well, today is not that crazy. And what I promote around the world now is what I call conscious care economics. It's conscious, it's, it's alive, it's, it's a reflection of ourself with the capital S, but also taking care of everyone, everything, and the totality. Another thing that it's, it's a ongoing desire that is began from many years ago is the creation of the of this uh, planetary being hmm. you know education today is from the 16th century it's not education for the future hmm. this planetary being need to have an ability to become the other without losing their own identity mm -hmm. become the other and not losing our identity. you cannot be in a planetary society without your own identity is your own identity the power of exchange, the power of interconnectedness. Mm. And of course, last but not least, is eliminate suffering. You know, eliminate suffering. And, and this suffering comes particularly for by not understanding how reality really is. Yeah. And so this is something that Buddhism and Hinduism have a lot in common and they have worked on this for thousands of years. Yes, you are right. They have worked on suggesting ways to eliminate suffering for thousands of years. 
a reason of uh, suffering and also a way to eliminate suffering is power. Because uh, we have talked about spirituality and creating a better world. And uh, because I would like to explore more your vision, I must ask you this question. If you had absolute power, which three things you would change in the world? <laughs> I hope I don't have absolute power. <laughs> I'm so limited, so limited that it will be probably a disaster. But <laughs> if I have that as a way of bringing concreteness to some things, because you have something very important in the question. Mm -hmm. The first thing people do when you ask them for a challenge is, oh, I don't have time. Mm -hmm. I don't have power. I don't have resources. The mind doesn't need money, doesn't need any resource, it needs yourself. So I will divide it in three. The first one is what I will do in the outer ecology. I will clean all the bodies of water of the world. I will protect all the natural forests of the world, flora, fauna. I will make all the cities of the world green cities. Wow. wow. On the second, on our inner ecology, to develop what I call container consciousness. Container consciousness is a concept very old in traditional Buddhism. It took me nine years to find it and understand it. You know, and what it means is before I said that spirituality is, the energy of spirituality is like an upside down funnel. It's like this. It's not like this and it's not like this. You know, you do your work, you do your uh, collective uh, intersection and then go back and it's like this. This is the spiritual energy. But what is there in between the silo and the open part of the funnel? How is that possible that I have my connectivity with myself, with my own eyes, with the wisdom of my vision, but then I have to connect with the wisdom of your vision. Otherwise we don't see each other. You know, if, if our collective wisdoms of our vision don't connect, I don't see you. I, I simply don't see you. You know, I, there are many things between me and the computer that I don't see and, and I'm sure there are plenty of things in between me and the computer. So, what is there exactly in that inflection point is container consciousness, a consciousness that is capable to understand the wisdom and reality of the individual as well as the collective at the same time. For example, the body is collective consciousness. The body has a totality, has a collective, you know? I move the arms, I speak, it's a collective, but also it contains the points of individual consciousness of the eye, the nose, the mouth, the ears, and so on and so forth. So that is the second. And the third is on the social human side of life. You know, to eliminate absolute poverty, this can be done, this is not a problem. And to have a society that it is at the same time materially and spiritually rich. In a sense, no country in the world can be proclaim itself as being rich if there is one poor person in it. Really, the richness is not just numbers. The richness is of a state of reality. So we need to understand very well how we create wealth, how we distribute wealth, how do we consume wealth, how do we protect wealth. Those will be the three groups that I will do. What a wonderful answer. Listening to you, I have a pretty good idea of what are your sources of power and inspiration. However, uh, I want to hear the answer from you. You have been actively working for scores of international issues since beginning. What inspires you to keep on keeping on? I have, over the years, begin to realize the source of my happiness. You, you, cannot, you cannot live life all the time angry and despair and, you know, somehow either you forgive, either you enter into a state of contentment, either you, you have to do something. So I realize that part of the source of my individual happiness is this world, is, is this 
thing to be done. In other words, it, there is always a translation into a state that is funny to use the word because it sounds really weird, but you enter all of the time in a spaces of ecstasy. You know, you say, wow, the sun is up. Wow, how come? How, how come again is up? And I am up. And I have my son. And there is the outer son. How do I connect these two suns? What keeps me going yes. is that it is possible to change the world and change it now. It's not something out of the, the mind. The, the history of humanity shows how many changes we have been able to do. I went to India when India was 382 million people. Today is 1.5 billion. You know, when many people die of hunger, now very rare, you know, that that, that happened. And, and finally, that this human collective consciousness, the totality of us, you know, is a major means of change. It's not just having, I have, I make. No, it's this consciousness that is going to do the, the trick that is going to do the, the stuff. So that keeps me going because it gives me hope that it doesn't depend on 20,000 things, but it depends on me, on you. It's a matter of deciding to do it. It's not like we are in a box and we cannot do anything. Right. Being conscious of the right in the past, present and future and change for the better. And then hope are great sources of inspiration. You are moving on and on as a, as a non-stoppable and vigorous power. What are your future plans? My future plans are very uh, ambitious. Great. <laughs> Some people say, you know, who knows? But first, as part of this future plan, always be there the yoga of nature, the healing of the planet. Without healing of the planet, we cannot heal ourselves. You know, the, great, the grand law of healing, as I have presented it in, internationally, it says that it is impossible to find a healthy human being in a sick planet. That is impossible. So this is a dance. We are dancing. The consciousness of nature and the consciousness of humanity dance to be able to find this optimal relationship between and inside this great matrix of life. And so this is so very, very important. I will continue to write about it, teach, speak up, advocate many issues, you know, counseling people, meditation, and so on. Also, uh, I will continue spending until I go, I don't know where, but presumably I will go, uh, studying Hindu and Buddhist scriptures. I think there is a lot more than I need to learn. I have been doing this for, for more than a half a century, but I think it's still uh, I need much, much more. It, it, my future plans, youth and future generations. Very, very important. My generation, uh, it's impossible. It's always contesting the change, pulling the change, putting a stick on the bicycle of change. No, no, I want you to become the leaders now. You don't need to wait any longer. There is nothing you need to wait for. Right. And, all, and finally, what uh, is in my future plan is to try to create this school of bodhisattvas, you know, people who are dedicated to others, but, but within a path of enlightenment, you know, enlightenment for others. So that's, that's all I want to do at this point in my life. And, and it's a lot because I also have these international positions like in education for world peace, you know, I need to set a strategic uh, papers and, and ways to get education into peace, which is not self-evident because peace, you cannot buy in the supermarket. It's not a material thing. Peace is a state of being. So as my teacher Lama Ganchen used to say, inner peace is the most solid foundation for world peace. We are not going to have peace in Ukraine and Russia if we don't find a new state of consciousness. This is impossible. This is not about tanks. This is not about weapons. You cannot go to war and bring back peace. This is impossible. This is a crazy thing. The world is on a crazy path 
with regard to peace, security, migration, and so on and so forth. So I want to join forces with everyone. This is not a solo flight. This is something we need to do all together. And wherever I can do something, wherever I, people feel that I have the possibility of making a contribution, I'll be there. India, Chile, US, Europe, doesn't matter. Technology today allows us to communicate not only the words, the sounds, but the heart. Right. These conversations are not frozen. These conversations have emotions, have, have intensity, have you know, truth in them. Yes, the realization of possibilities makes all of us a formidable force. In the truest senses of emotions, uh, destiny, and truth. Awesome. I have come to the last question. Uh, please share your message for the youth, women, world leaders, and people in general. First of all, I will give you a phrase that must transform you and humanity to make the impossible possible. This is so important. Many people call them miracles. You know, oh, this is impossible. Now it's a miracle. Okay. You are a miracle. We are a miracle. We contain miracles. We are the source of miracles. We are the ones who judge the impossible and the possible. So let's not live only in the impossible, in the no world. Let's live in the world of the yes. Yes, we can. We can do it. Second, you must understand that we live in a planetary society, but it's not just a society. It's not something atomized. It's a family. And therefore, the big mantra of this planetary family is, I am because you are. You are because I am. Let's join forces together. Don't stay in a corner. Don't be a victim of change. Be an architect of change. Then I will tell you, protect our common heritage. India has heritage that belongs to humanity at large. The Buddhist, the, the Hindu gods are for all of us. It's not only for Hindus. Right. The, the, the Buddha is not only for Buddhists. It's for everyone. Christ is not only for Christians, it's for everyone. This is, you know, I'm a Buddhist and then I enter some other temples or churches and people say, what are you doing here praying to this? You are Buddhist. I said, I, who told you that this is your religion <laughs> monopoly of this entity, this deity? You know, Ganesha, you know, it's for the whole world. Hanuman, it's for the whole world. Right. You know, it's not just for, for Hindus, for Jains. It's for everyone. So this human family, you know, needs to understand that I am because you are, you are because I am. And the better you are, the better I am. We cannot leave people behind. We need to play to protect this common heritage that we have. It is not a luxury. Many people when talk about common heritage, they, oh, this is something for the rich. This is survival. Mm. Our common heritage is the ozone layer. Our common heritage is the oceans. Our common heritage is the climate. It's our biodiversity. So this is not a luxury. This is part of our survival. Right. Of course, this requires commitment and action. But not just any commitment, not just any action. And here I will cite the Gita, because maybe this is, will be heard by many Hindus. Gita says, karma, karma yoga. Nothing will result without action. Right. We need to be in action. But it's a, it's a yoga that determines the quality of yoga that determines the quality of that action. So we need to live in, in this karma yoga world. We need to create this world. Because to establish a new vision, we need a new consciousness. The old consciousness does not have the inner mechanism, it doesn't have the inner attributes of this new vision. So we need together to create this big new consciousness. And I end up by asking everyone who is listening at this point, 
how will future generation judge us? How do you want the future generation to judge you? What do they, what do you want them to say about you? Did you commit it? Did you take the risks? Did you engage? Did you actually happily engage, not angrily engage? All, everything is in our hands. It's not in the government hands, in the divine hands. Yes, divine is vitally important. Don't take me wrong. But we have a self-responsibility with creation. We are the creatures, but we need to respect creation. We need to enlarge creation. We are not here to make more poor people. We are not here to make more conflict. Today, in the world, it takes one minute to get millions of dollars to go to war. Yeah. But it takes ages to get one dollar for peace. Right. If someone would say, what do you want to be written when you die you know, in a cemetery? I don't know where I will be, but anyways, I would say I like my grandchildren to say he committed. He went for our generation until the last moment. He committed, not that I was successful, not that I did many things, but I was truly committed from my inner guts, from my spiritual guts to create a new world for all of you. Thank you. Awesome, wonderful, brilliant. I can go on and on to describe your personality and the thoughts uh, you carry and generate. Dr. Alfredo, it was a great experience talking to you. More and more people uh, from all countries of the globe must listen to, uh, understand, and imbibe your thoughts, ideas, um, philosophies, and spirituality, especially the youth of today. And uh, also world leaders in all fields must learn a great deal from you. Your thoughts and philosophies can light a lot of uh, dark places around the globe. Our entire team of World Growth Forums and I wish you the best in life. I'm sure your way of life, your various initiatives and endeavors and uh, your passion to transform the world for better, for good, would go a long way in inspiring a large part of the world. Thank you very much for talking to World Growth Forums. Good day to you. Bye. Namaste. Thank you. Yeah. Much love. Much peace. Bye. Thank Namaste. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Alfredo, for a great discussion. Now I would like to present to you my question answer session with Mr. Daba Mandela, which you recorded earlier. Mr. Daba Mandela uh, is the chairman of Mandela Institute for Humanity in the United States and chairman of Africa Rising Foundation in South Africa. And he's the grandson of Mr. Nelson Mandela. Today we have Daba Mandela with us. I'm honored to speak with Daba a second time under our IP WGF I Talks with Daba Mandela. For the viewers, we will share the link uh, for our first conversation in the descriptions, please. Uh, Daba Mandela is a world-renowned name. He is an author, mentor, spokesperson, entrepreneur, political consultant, and the grandson of Nelson Mandela. Daba has been working committedly towards helping youth understand and unleash their limitless power to change the world for better. He's also helping the youth understand the values and spirit of Nelson Mandela. So they're able to drive their thoughts and lives in the right direction and contribute towards creating a better world. We will explore Daba's various initiatives, his deeply moving and highly impactful and rewarding thoughts and philosophies and the promises he holds in his heart for himself and countless others out there in the world, all through a session of questions and answers. Hello, Dava. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very fine. Thank you so much. So good to let's see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you, actually. Let's start with the questions straight, please. Uh, I would try to paint a canvas for our viewers with several bright and inspiring colors of your highly impactful and highly inspirational life. You never know. Someone in some corner of the world may be waiting for a single ray of hope and inspiration to turn around or transform his or her life. And this interview may serve its purpose. 
we believe that if we are able to improve even one human being's life, our purpose is served. If we are able to improve more lives, then God has chosen us for a greater purpose. Our viewers seek inspiration from personal challenges and triumphs too. So I would um, also slightly touch upon your personal life and future aspiration. Let's start with that first question. Nelson Mandela won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1993 for his work for the peaceful termination of the apartheid regime and for laying the foundations for a new democratic South Africa. He remains Africa's greatest freedom symbol. You have launched the Mandela Leadership Program, 100 Mandelas. What is the 100 Mandelas program? What are its goals and objectives? Well, <clears throat> the 100 Mandelas program seeks to find the next generation of leaders that will take us beyond nation states, but take us in a world where we recognize each other as humanity living in a global world. The one biggest issue that we have in this world right now is that we do not have any good leaders. If I had to ask you today, if you look at all the presidents around the world, how many presidents would you say are good presidents? One, two, three. Today, as we are in, in today's world, 21st of April, how many good presidents do we have? And you know what? I asked many young people and many old people and all kinds of people, and nobody can even tell me that there are three good presidents in the world today. Now, that's a shame when you look at the fact that we have over 205 countries in the world. And so what I'm trying to do with the 100 Mandelas is to make young people understand that nothing is going to change in this world unless they themselves enter the realm of public service and civic service. You know, we need young people to aspire to becoming the next secretary head of state, right? Or the secretary of Homeland Security, or the one who's going to be in charge of different policy making and formulation on a government level that will affect change for the whole nation. You see, we can't have every single young person wanting to be head of a corporation, want to drive a Ferrari. Otherwise, but when you look at the world today and you see all the news that's coming out, right? There's corruption and the scandal. When you look at the government, it's corruption and more scandal. So young people actually do not want to go into that realm. But actually, I want to inspire young people to say, listen, Nelson Mandela, at the age of six years old, when he went to school for the first time, he wore his father's pants and he had no shoes on. He was wearing bare feet. And he rose to become one of the greatest leaders in the world. And today, young people, we have tablets, we have internet, we have Google, we have gadgets, we have technology, we have science. So there's nothing that stops us from actually becoming the greatest leaders, not of tomorrow, but of today, you see. And so I want to take young people between the age of 24 to 35 on an immersive course to learn about the values, the principles, and the leadership style of Nelson Mandela and how they can take those very same values and lessons and make them their own, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a community leader, how can you make sure that you actually enter the realm of public service and serve those who cannot serve themselves and stand up for those who are less privileged and marginalized communities in our world? That's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to inspire the next generation of Nelson Mandela-like leaders, Gandhi-type leaders, Martin Luther type leaders. These are the leaders that we want for the next generation. Really great. I'm so impressed. Though it's hard to believe that in today's time, which we call the 21st century, uh, people still believe in believe and indulge in various kinds of discriminations. It is a hard reality of the world. Uh, I'm sure 100 Mandela's leadership program would create 100 world leaders like Nelson Mandela, who would be ready to inspire thousands more with their thoughts, words, and deeds. Um, and then the cycle would continue to inspire more and more leaders to do the right things for a better world. Exactly. Yeah. Nelson Mandela is a real world example that if one man decides to fight for what is right for the majority, justice for all, and fight for end of oppression by one set of human beings over others, then even the mightiest must yield. And uh, we are talking about the time period of 1960s and 1990s. 
general awareness about rights and duties and information about Nelson Mandela is widespread now. Uh, isn't it easier for a group of leaders or for a country's citizens to understand the fight for their rights? Uh, isn't it better in every sense in 2023 to gather everyone around, help them see and understand the right perspectives and achieve growth, prosperity and equality for all or whatever else is lacking in South Africa or the entire African continent? Yes. You see, the one thing that every single person wants in life is progress. The man who used to be a director wants to be the CEO. A man who was living in a shack wants to live in a house. You know, you want to send your kids to better schools and better schools, right? You want to give people the opportunities to do something that they aspire to. You know, we want people to have hope and to have faith that they can achieve something better than they were able to do where they come from. You know, each generation has the one responsibility to do it better than the generation that they come from. So our responsibility actually is to leave this world in a better shape than we found it and to make sure that you contribute to making this world a better place than when you found it. So if a leader is not working for the progression of the majority of, its, of this population, then that leader is not fit to be a leader. You know, we need to make sure that we are electing the right amount of the, the right leaders with moral high standing and have values, but more importantly, they need to understand that in order for me to make a difference in someone else's life, I cannot go there with preconceived notions. I need to go there and listen to what their challenges are, because most of the time, the people who are experiencing challenges are also the people who have solutions to their challenges. So when you go and listen firstly, and you understand, then you'll be in a more powerful position to help those people overcome those challenges because now you've been building the solution together. Not that Jesus is coming to save us. No, work with the people to know what the people's challenges are and therefore you can come up with the solutions together and together you can create a better society. The problem we have in today's South Africa is that you have a few people who are in a position of power who are close to the president who believe that they should be the ones to so what they call eat, right? Everybody has to eat because food is the basic thing that humanity needs. Food, shelter, medical care, right? That is a basic need that every human being. But now when you have people who believe that they deserve better than others, that is when you have a problem in society. And that's what we're seeing in South Africa today. That is why leadership becomes so critical. And that is why I'm spending most of my time in making sure that the next generation of leaders are conscious and understand that they are there to serve, not to be number one. A leader is not about being number one or being about being the best. A leader is about serving others. And that's the type of leaders that we want. And we don't have these kind of leaders today. So we need to change and inspire the, work, the young people to see. Look at John F. Kennedy, right? Look at Marcus Garvey. Huh? There are so many people who, have, who are great examples, men and women who have fought. And I think today we're beginning to forget about these heroes that we had. And so it's our duty to remind our young people that there are no you know, real barriers to us achieving our success. It's really about us understanding what is important in this world. And that is making sure that we help other people so that we can slowly but surely eliminate the challenges that we have. You're absolutely right. I personally understand that fundamentally all of us are fighting our own one man or one woman battle in life. Uh, only when we have done something worthwhile that people start noticing us. And even then, mobilizing resources together is an immensely difficult task. Till then, all of us are fighting our own individual battles. Though it is definitely easier in 2023 to gather everyone around, keeping them together till the collective goals are achieved is quite difficult. I completely understand your point of view. Um, and I'm sure sooner than later, things would turn around. We are the same age, you know, and I, I want to see you grow and lead the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you.
Yeah. The youth of Africa holds tremendous possibilities to enhance the endless opportunities of Africa. They must understand the greatness of Africa and the legacy it holds in its bosom. While Africa has given to the world the largest desert, it has also given the longest river. Uh, while it has given to the world the biggest animal of today, the African elephant, it has also given the fastest animals, the cheetahs and the gazelles. Um, what I mean to point out by these examples is the greatness of Africa since time immemorial. Um, a great people of the past, a great land, can regain their magnificent glory if they unite as a force and work for it gradually yet consistently. Um, how can this great power of youth be focused and harnessed? How can the youth be inspired and guided towards a common goal? You know, we are here in this world. We have just come out of COVID. COVID was a disease that uh, ravaged every single nation in the world. And we had to, you know, even though we had to stay apart, we had to stay in constant communication of what was the way in which to protect yourself. Do we wear a mask? Don't wear a mask? Are we getting vaccinated? Are we not getting vaccinated? So communication is obviously very important. Us coming together to speak about our issues on the one platform so that we can be able to understand what each other is saying is very important. Um, so what we, what we need is solidarity. We have lost the solidarity that we once had when we had the pan-Africanist uh, movements across Africa, when it was the liberation movements that took place across Africa. You know, when you go to a country like Tanzania, Tanzania under Julius Nyerere was a country that basically housed all the liberation parties. So the ANC, the African National Congress from South Africa was there. The ZANU-PF from Zimbabwe was there. You know, you go to the APLA of Angola, they were there. You know, all the liberation movements had a home in one country of Tanzania because they were all supporting each other. And also, South Africa would have not been able to win against apartheid had it not been for the support of, of countries like Ethiopia, Algeria, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. And I can mention literally the whole sub-Saharan Africa. They were helping us with passports, with training and military, right? With resources to get on with our struggle. And today to see young people talk about xenophobia and trying to kick out our brothers and sisters who are here and not understand, or maybe they have forgotten how we want this freedom. So if we as Africans need to understand our history and understand where we come from in order for us to know where we're going, you know, we say, divided we fall, united we stand. The unity and solidarity are the key things that we need to understand that we are more powerful together than we can ever be working in silos. And we need to, as young people, work together and, and stop. Yes, there's good competition, but there's also bad competition that exists, right? And so we as young people in our own journeys to trying to achieve success, we need to understand that it doesn't take away from you if you help someone else in their journey to achieving success. Because ultimately, we're all moving towards creating more unified world but a better world. And that is only going to happen if we are talking openly, honestly, about the challenges that we face in order for us to really, you know, be, be honest about our, our fears, our challenges, but more importantly, our hopes and our dreams. What a beautiful answer. Thank you. I absolutely believe in you. There's no doubt that the collective youth hold the greatest power in the world. Uh, leaders like you can offer them a direction. And I feel our time is the best time, you know, for bringing permanent changes in the world. Uh, as about two generations earlier, uh, and of course, before that, limited technological advances and awareness restrain people in, you know, achieving goals at global levels and as quickly as needed to create a meaningful difference. Um, today, the speed with which information can be spread using the latest technology would help a large number of people understand and work for a cause. Um, 
and I say I feel our time is the best for bringing permanent changes in the world because um, the way uh, and with the speed the technology is advancing and uh, the way it is opening possibilities um, of its use in both good and bad manners we don't know what is going to happen in the future uh, it might be good and I pray that it is good um, but if it is not it will be a disaster what according to you should be the main focus of Africa to make it one giant mammoth of unity prosperity and equality is it education uh, is it economic independence is it technological development is it uh, cultural enhancement is it optimum resource utilization or instead of focusing on any one the main focus must be a right mixture of all of these and then some more well i mean i, I would say obviously just from the top of mind it's, it's more than one thing it's a combination of things yes education is very important yes unity is probably one of the most underlying factors um, that brings us together. Um, optimization, of course, is, is also important. But, you know, what's really important for, for Africa is, number one, is for us to come and work together. Number two is to really to be able to take control of our resources. There is no reason why we are not manufacturing and producing the very same products that we export as raw materials and then we import them back for finished products, but at 10 times the price, 100 times the price. You know, this is where we're really uh, doing ourselves a disservice. But is it ourselves who are doing the service, or is it because we are against the colonial powers that came, you know, when they decided, when the scramble of Africa was taking place and they decided to chop up the African continent in the way, in the borders that you see today. And so what they did was they divided and conquered. But now we know better, right? Our leaders know better. But again, you know, it's, it's, it's our leaders. It goes back to leadership because when the Chinese man comes with a bag of money and he says he wants to put a mine in your backyard and who are the people that allow the Chinese man to come in and to build a stadium using Chinese materials, using Chinese labor? It's the leaders. You understand what I'm saying? They were the ones who were accepting that big bag of money and allowing the Chinese. So you can't really blame the Chinese. You have to blame our leaders because they are too short-sighted in their thinking. They're not thinking the detrimental effect that it's going to have on generations. We want an Africa that is built by Africans, built for Africans. But it is our leaders who are continuously selling us out. And that is why it is important that this generation of leaders, the young people, have to come together and rise. So unity and taking control of our resources so that we can be able to manufacture the very same goods. Now, you look at the vaccines around the world that are being produced. I mean, there's over probably 100 different vaccines and different raw materials coming from different parts of the world. We, as, as Africa have about 50% of those natural uh, raw materials that it takes to produce those vaccines. But none of those vaccines are actually produced in Africa. So we need to be able to take control of the value add process in terms of the industrial value chain. But we're only gonna be able to do that when we come together. So we say the rubber guys, those are the guys in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, the cocoa guys, those are the guys in East Africa. The guys who are the timber, those are the guys in South Africa. The guys with the financial, those are the guys from Nigeria. And then when we come together and we optimize, like you said, this is how we as Africans will be able to start begin to prosper through unity and through control of our resources. Right. Africa holds a huge potential in its heart. It should take uh, the lead in bringing changes. Education and technology are definitely important. Uh, if the people are led by insightful and visionary leaders like you in the selfless way, Africa would uh, lead the world in future. You had shared with me during one of our conversations that in association with uh, Ms. Bernice King, daughter of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. and Ms. Ilyasa Shabazz, daughter of the human rights activist Malcolm X, you wish to launch a youth leadership program. Please tell us more about it. So this leadership program is really aimed at young people between the ages of 24 to 35 
who are aspiring to be community leaders, uh, change agents and activists in their own right. And it basically is modeled of the values principles of Nelson Mandela. And when we look at Nelson Mandela, we say, what are the values of Nelson Mandela? You know, we talk about integrity. We talk about passion. We're talking about man with a vision. We talk about courage, right? And we talk about a number of other characteristics that form who Nelson Mandela really was. And so this year we're kicking off by choosing 15 young people uh, from across the world, right? Uh, people of African origin who will then be taken on a two-part uh, series uh, of, a, of, a, of a leadership program. The first part is in part, well, the whole, the whole program is in part with the two sisters that you mentioned, which is Eliasa Shabazz, uh, Malcolm X's daughter, as well as Bernice King, Martin Luther King's uh, Jr.'s daughter. And we are going to be doing six online master classes. This is the first part, where they will also be teaching about the values of their respective fathers as well, together with myself. And then after they do the six weeks online master classes, that part two, basically they get to travel to South Africa and have an in-house program where they walk in the footsteps of Nelson Mandela. So in Johannesburg, where he established the first black law firm and became an activist and joined the ANC, then moving back to the Eastern Cape, where he learned about traditional governance when he was growing up under the king, and then finally moving to Cape Town, where he was in Robben Island for 27 years, and we say, what are the key elements and key values that Nelson Mandela learned in these monumental times of his life? And how do we then use them in our own businesses and in our own communities to move in the same way as Nelson Mandela? And of course, this is in partnership with American Express. This is also in partnership with the University of Port Elizabeth, who are going to be drawing up our curriculum. Uh, uh, working with Professor Margaret. And um, we are very, very proud uh, to be launching this. We're going to be announcing this program actually in July uh, during Mandela Month. Mandela Day is on the 18th of July. Wow. The youth must understand both the philosophies and sacrifices of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Um, it's good that uh, children and grandchildren are trying to keep their legacies alive and working towards elimination of uh, discrimination and inequalities. Um, combined forces would yield results sooner. I offer my best wishes. Yeah. Thank you. You have repeatedly stressed on the importance and power of communication within communities. If uh, we all have meaningful discussions and understand our mutual challenges, we can together find solutions to even the most difficult problems. Uh, you have said earlier that um, it is in our hands to work together to make a better world. However, the most difficult challenge appears to be, you know, understanding our mutual challenges coming together and then working together for common goals. What, according to you, can bring communities together? What can bring Africans together? What can uh, bring Africans, Indians, Americans and others together? What can bring black and white together? Well, I think we have to think about the kind of world we want our children to grow up in. You know, I have a 12-year-old son and a 9-year-old daughter. And whether you're black, white, Indian, Chinese, you want your children to grow in a world that is safe, right, and secure, that they can be able to go to school and come back without any issues. You want them to have good quality education, right? You want them to have good quality health care, right? So you want the basics that humanity needs to be safeguarded for the future of this world and the future of your kids. Now that we can all agree, it doesn't matter what color you are. Now, if we can come together and agree on the basics, then I don't see why we cannot agree on many more things, you know? I mean, look at what makes up uh, race, right? Between what's the difference between a black person, a white person, Indian person, a Chinese person? Our race is less than 1% of what makes up the human body, right? So that means that we have 99% in common, right? So why are we focusing on the 1% that separates us when we can be focusing on the 99 that unites us as humanity? Great. 
I understand that uh, till the time we are divided on any basis, um, be it uh, caste, religion, race or color, someone would take advantage and keep all of us deprived of our basic rights uh, and a united world. We can talk about the right things, the right perspectives. Communication is indeed a great power. However, I would like to observe how things unfold and what shape does the world take. And as you said, you know, we must focus on that 99%. What all are you working on currently? Uh, how are you planning to make a difference in the world through your foundations, Africa Rising in South Africa and the Mandela Institute for Humanity in the United States? So with Africa Rising, we have mainly focused traditionally on youth led initiatives so for example we partnered with the university of uh, pretoria when we brought some uh, veterinarian students to talk about veterinary skills you know a lot of the time you have kids who are living in the rural areas and their biggest advantage is agriculture uh, but the picture of success to our young people is wearing a suit and carrying a briefcase and walking into an air-conditioned building so we need to also try to you know, educate the young people that even somebody working in agriculture, working with cows, working with plants, can become as successful as the person that's working in an office. And so what we did, we did career guidance with most of our kids, focusing mainly on high school kids, right? And now we have actually not, not only doing youth, but even though youth is still our core uh, sort of uh, beneficiaries, Last year, we started a new initiative where we took doctors and nurses uh, to rural areas and we actually targeted the elderly, the elderly people who are marginalized and poor, who do not have access or the resources to actually travel to town to see a doctor. And even if they see the doctor, how will they buy the medicine, right? And so we got the doctors to come and, and look at the elderly, test them, check them, give them um, classes on nutrition, uh, on exercise, for the right age, um, and also gave them medicine for free. So this was in a new initiative that we started with Africa Rising. So Africa Rising is really a community-led and a community-based organization that looks about after the challenges that people have in the most, you know, rural areas of South Africa. But our 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 challenge was obviously finance, as most you know organizations, non-profit organizations, is it's always a financial thing, and so. When I got the opportunity to, to travel to America and I wrote my book from America and I got a deal in America, I was more exposed to America and we decided that it would be actually smart if we then opened up a new organization in America that would not only also focus on youth activation as we have with Africa Rising, but on this one, we would be focusing more on youth leadership, right? And making sure that we have the resources enough to then funnel back to South Africa. So we've continued with our youth um, activations, but more focusing on leadership and also making sure that the financial model for sustaining our programs is very much hinged on the Mandela Institute in America, because in America, we're much more exposed to donors and the, um, the <coughs> philanthropic uh, community more than we are in South Africa. Awesome. I really appreciate the way you are working your hardest, you know, for the rise of Africa and for humanity. Uh, it's not easy in today's times to committedly work for such noble goals. People prefer to run after materialism and other worldly possessions and fake notions of success. Learning quite late in life the importance of lost time and lost opportunities. What you are doing at your age with dedication and right values is outstanding. I have come to the last question now. Youth in the world have the power to change evil to good. Old people have the wisdom to direct and drive the power of youth. Please share your message for youth and old people. There are weak and strong people in the world in various senses. Weak know where to make the effort and strong are capable of making successful efforts. Please share your message for weak and strong people. So the message I have for young people and old people alike is that I want to say 
I believe in something greater than myself. I believe there's a higher power that, that lives outside of myself, outside of this world, in a spiritual realm. Maybe it was ancestors, maybe it's, it's, it's God, maybe it's Allah, maybe it's, you know, um, a higher power. And I, and, I, and I talk to this higher power. Whenever I'm in a time of trouble, whenever I'm in a time of not sure which way to go, which choice to make, I always call on to the higher power. And I believe that whenever you talk to the highest power, not, don't just only call him in that time of trouble, but also, you know, speak to him just to say thank you for waking up. Thank you for allowing me to see the sun once again. Thank you for allowing me to kiss my son and my daughter once again. And so the message to them is to say, I want you to dream big. I want you to dream so big that your dreams scare you. If your dreams don't scare you, then you are not dreaming big enough. Martin Luther King had a dream. John F. Kennedy had a dream. Harriet Tubman had a dream. Nelson Mandela had a dream. It begins with the dream. Many of us will have big dreams, and some people will laugh at us. Some people will say, oh, you're just a dreamer. But guess what? It begins with the dream. And as you're working towards that big dream, understand that there will be hurdles and there will be speed bumps along the way. But what you need to do is make sure that you have a mentor with you, somebody who loves you, somebody that wants to see you succeed, um, and somebody that believes in you. You know, So you can always go, them, go to them for advice. And how do you eat an elephant, ladies and gentlemen? An elephant is huge. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So how do we achieve our goal? One day at a time, right? Let us not forget to celebrate those small wins that we get as we're walking towards that big dream, right? And I want to say there's, there's, there's a verse that comes from the Bible. I am a Christian. I want to share this message with both young and old people. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Absolutely. You are a man of great wisdom at a very young age. More and more youth from all over the world must listen to you and imbibe your thoughts and philosophies in their lives. I feel uh, that a lot many of us die or stop pushing ourselves for what we believe in. Uh, with the still undiscovered and unplayed music in our lives. You and others like you can help them choose a direction and understand their purpose in the world. Thank you very Thank much you. for this interview. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I you feel, very much. Yeah. Yes. I feel I have learned several more things after talking to you. Uh, and I have clarified a uh, few more of my perspectives. You have thrown light on so many important issues which we face on a daily basis, but in our various pressures of life, we conveniently choose to ignore them. Thank you for this conversation. It was a great experience talking to you. Personally, I and the entire team of World Growth Forums wish you best in life. I'm sure your way of life, uh, your various initiatives and endeavors and your passion to transform the world for better, for good would go a long way in inspiring a large part of the world. Thank you very much. You and the whole team a prosperous future and continue doing the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking to World Good Forums. Good day to you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Mr. Dava Mandela, for a powerful and inspiring discussion. This brings us to the end of day two of virtual WGF GBIF. I thank all the keynote speakers of today, all panelists of our highly interesting panel discussion, and the participants of our question and answer sessions. We look forward to more keynote speeches and uh, book launch event on the concluding day, day three of our virtual WGF GBIF. Thank you and bye for today. <laughs> <laughs>